We're running five minutes late.
Hi, everybody. Um, everybody, please take your place. Sorry, we ran a little bit late. Um, my name is Anton Emelianov. Uh, I am uh, one of the organizers, uh, the chair of the planning committee uh, running this event. Um, welcome, everybody. It's great to have uh, a lot of uh, familiar faces. Um, first of all, um, uh, as you uh, may know, uh, we have ran over the last two days um, uh, Bitcoin Edge uh, Dev Plus uh, Plus, where we have uh, trained over um, uh, over 80 uh, uh, new developers uh, in that joined our ecosystem, where we have covered a variety of topics um, from ECDSA to uh, discrete log uh, contracts, and that has been very uh, positive. Uh, we're working uh, jointly as a community uh, toward uh, uh, enhancing the uh, development, you know, scaling the development capacity uh, of the industry all together uh, as there's a big need in um, developers who are proficient in uh, Bitcoin and uh, uh, TLDs. So um, I'd like uh, to thank all the trainers that have uh, participated, uh, Jimmy Song, uh, John Newbery, the DigiLab uh, uh, team. Please give a round of applause uh, to the... <laughs> it was extremely interesting and uh, uh, I, I think a lot of people learned uh, a lot of uh, information. Uh, all of these sessions will be published uh, online in about one, two weeks time uh, for the internet community to absorb and uh, walk around that. Um, so welcome to Scaling. Um, I'd like to um, also thank um, uh, oh, the planning committee, uh, Jeremy Rubin, um, Neha Narula, uh, Byron Gibson, uh, Ferdinando Metrano uh, and Alison Berke uh, for working uh, together uh, to put together this to put together this event. Uh, it has been um, um, a lot of hard work, and uh, we have um, a lot of interesting uh, material coming up uh, for you over the next two days. Um, so a little bit about uh, the uh, the purpose of uh, scaling now. Um, uh, I'm not a public speaker myself, I'm an engineer uh, uh, driving this event and um, uh, I have uh, a personal interest in engineering approach um, uh, toward uh, the uh, ecosystem, toward exploring the uh, technology that is uh, developing around uh, the new uh, uh, br breakthrough uh, elements that uh, Bitcoin has introduced many years ago. Uh, so, th uh, a bit about the purpose of scaling. Um, so, uh, what we want to do is, uh, uh, with scaling is ensure that Bitcoin is um, uh, aware of the most suitable advances in uh, cryptography for cryptocurrencies and has uh, processes to develop the technical capacity within the development community to safely deploy and scale. Um, to um, uh, help Bitcoin to continue innovate, uh, and um, uh, we want to, we encourage the conversation uh, as to how uh, innovation occurs, especially between the uh, between the layers of uh, Bitcoin. Uh, we have seen the em emergent emergence of the layer two, such as Lightning. So um, uh, we want, as a community, to uh, see how. Uh, that process uh, takes place. Um, uh, we want to keep um, uh, cluelessness and misinformation entropy down uh, to the minimum uh, by ensuring the uh, repository of technical correct information and uh, community coordination mechanisms for uh, super exponential growth. Um, uh, this is uh, the place, uh, has been from day one, uh, is the place to have a high bandwidth conversation uh, w w 
for community uh, within itself to sync on development priorities, uh, common, pay, pain, common pain points, and um, uh, mutual interest. Uh, this is the place where we want to focus on engineering, uh, not politics. Uh, we, we want everybody to have uh, objective discussion uh, from the engineering standpoint. Uh, please take uh, a moment to uh, review the code of conduct on the website. Uh, we have a uh, no, um, no video and no pictures uh, policy. We'd like to have uh, respect the privacy of uh, attendees. And um, with that, I'd like to open uh, and introduce Alison Berkey of um, uh, Stanford Cyber Initiative. Thank you, Anton. Thank you all for coming to Stanford. I'm really happy to have you here. I'm Allison Burke. I'm the executive director of the Stanford Cyber Initiative, which I run along with our faculty directors, Mike McFall and Dan Bonet, who I assume most of you have heard of. We're really happy to have you all here because at Stanford we've seen a tremendous amount of interest in Bitcoin and in cryptocurrencies in general. The Cyber Initiative supports some undergraduate courses in cryptography and in cryptocurrency, as well as a blockchain protocol conference that we run here every January. So we've seen a lot of student interest and we're very happy to have so many tremendous scholars here to speak to us about new topics in this field. If you have any questions about the venue, about Stanford, or about why it's raining when you're in California, please feel free to come to me. Uh, I'll be here all day and as well as tomorrow. Um, otherwise, I'd like to introduce our MC, Dan Elitzer, who founded the MIT Bitcoin Club. Thanks, Allison. Hi. So it's great to be here, and uh, uh, many of you may not know, but this event originally did not have an MC. Uh, then at the last minute, the organizing committee decided to insert me in here. Um, now it's come to my attention that some people maybe don't think we need an MC, think maybe we want a funnier MC, a taller MC, a MC with a little more capacity. Um, so I've got good news for you. If you don't like my jokes, you can try out Scaling Bitcoin XT or Scaling Bitcoin Classic or Scaling Bitcoin Unlimited. And uh, if you can't get more than a couple attendees and speakers to come over there, I hear 90% of the logistics crew is gonna move across the street and start up their own conference over there. Um, if you're wondering how we're gonna keep this event going when 90% of the logistics crew went over there, um, they're probably only getting paid about one-seventh of the salary over there, so I think they'll probably come back. But if the market shows that a lot of you want to go over there, um, then that's the free market. And the reason we're all here in the first place is because we believe that people should have a choice and should be here voluntarily and choose to participate. So the serious thing here is everyone here wants Bitcoin to succeed. We're all here because we're excited. A lot of you have been here when the price was orders of magnitude lower than it was. And so I just want us to all be respectful of each other and to engage with the speakers who've really put a lot of time and effort into these presentations. Um, so please just remember to adhere to the code of conduct. Um, we're trying to find common ground. We're trying to uh, discuss these ideas. And I'm basically just going to be playing traffic cop for the rest of the weekend and uh, making sure that we all spend as much time as possible focused on the presentations. So. Um, just before we get started, as Anton pointed out, um, code of conduct here, no photos, no video. We want to respect the privacy of all the participants. And we're operating under Chatham House rule. So that means that uh, any ideas you hear here, you're welcome to talk about during and after the event with people externally. But unless it happens on this stage or in one of the recorded sessions, please do not attribute it to the person or the organization that they're associated with. That's you know in the interest of everyone being open and engaging honestly here. So, um, uh, I think, uh, speakers, you have 25 minutes. You'll see a timer down here with a, with a clock counting down. The 25 minutes includes Q&A time. Please, please, please keep to it. Um, I will be coming up here after 25 minutes and introducing the next speaker, whether you're done or not. So please make that easy. Um, and with that, let's get started. So the first three talks today, um, are addressing the topic of uh, privacy and fungibility. And so our first speaker, do we have our first speaker, Pedro? Okay, so we've got Pedro Moreno Sanchez from Purdue University talking about concurrency and privacy with payment channel networks. Uh, thank you for the applause. Uh, can you hear me? 
Okay. Uh, so hello, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Pedro Moreno Sanchez, and this I'm going to talk about uh, concurrency and privacy with the uh, payment chain networks. And this is a joint work with uh, Julio Malavolta, Aniket Kate, Matteo Maffei, and Srivat Sanradi. Uh, I think it's not a surprise if I tell you today that Bitcoin has scalability issues, um, and that's the main reason why we are here today. So as we know that currently the Bitcoin network allows less than 10 transactions per second. The blockchain is, keeps growing, and today we have more than 135 gigabytes of memory required for that. And another problem is that the transaction fees are a bit uh, too high in order to have uh, applications like micropayments. Given this, is not, uh, this problem has been for a while, and several proposals have been out there. One of those is uh, the payment channels. Um, I guess that some of you know it, but for those of you who don't know how it works, uh, the main idea is that uh, payment channels allow payments between two users, and now they don't require to put every single payment in the blockchain. Uh, in an example depicted in the, in the figure, uh, Alice will create a payment channel with Bob. And in order to do that, Alice will create a deposit in which she deposits uh, five coins with Bob. Um, because Alice might not trust Bob in the first place, uh, Alice will use a contract that allows her to get the coins back after a certain time of time. The, in that manner, Alice makes sure that she can get the, the coins back. This is called the opening of a channel. And now when this is open, Alice and Bob can just pay each other off-chain, uh, basically by redistributing the balance that they have in the deposit. And, uh, and all of these transactions happen off-chain. Now at the end, when they uh, finish using the channel, they just can't close it. And this close of the channel means that there is a new transaction that goes into the blockchain, in which they just get the coins uh, that are in the channel for the last date of the payment. So in this manner, payment channels allow us to have multiple payments off-chain and requires only two transactions in the blockchain, one to open and one to close. So the natural idea now, the next step, is why we have a payment channel between every two users in the network. The point is that this doesn't really scale either. Uh, the point is that uh, for each channel, every a user will have to deposit co coins, will have to lock them in the channel, and a user might not be rich enough actually to create so many channels. So it's really impractical to have uh, n square channels in the network. Instead, what Alice can do if she wants to pay to Cat and she doesn't have a payment channel with her is to use other channels in the network and use other people as intermediate users. Example here, imagine that Alice wants to pay to Cat and use Bob as intermediary. In that manner, Alice can pay one coin to Bob, and then Bob will forward this coin to, to Cat. In this simple example, Bob has to be trusted, right? Uh, the, the naive thing that he can do is just get the coin from, from Alice and never forward it to, to Cat. Okay, so we need something that allows us to create multi-hop payments without the need of trusted intermediaries. Another thing that I want to say here, is, uh, just for the sake of time and example, I will just use a uh, uh, one-hop payment, but whatever I'm going to present here obviously escalates for more than one-hop payment as well, or multi-hop payment. So in order to have these untrusted payments, uh, uh, has been proposed a contract. It's called has time, like con uh, has time block contract. The idea here is to allow a conditional payment between two users, even though they might not trust each other. So the main idea is that Alice promised to pay to Bob one Bitcoin under the condition that Bob shows a value X such that the hash of such value X is equal to Y, a condition Y. And obviously before some amount of time. And at that moment when Bob receives this conditional payment, the only thing that he has to do is show this value X and send it to, to the Bitcoin network and then they will figure out that, okay, hash of X is equal to Y, so Bob will get actually the the one coin that was conditionally paid by, by Alice. This contract uh, has been used uh, in one of the proposed in practice to the payment chain network. It's called the Lightning Network. And the main idea there is to have multiple chained hash time lock contracts in order to enable multi hop payments between uh, untrusted users. Um, and let me show you how it works here in example. So cat will create a pair of values X and Y, where Y is just the hash of X, and send Y back to, to Alice. Now Alice will create a conditional payment of this condition, the condition Y. And Bob will forward this payment with the same amount, one coin, with the same condition Y. This moment Bob knows that he's not gonna lose coins because um, he knows that as soon as the X is revealed for 
the conditional payment with cat, he can just take that X and use it to pull coins from Alice. And in this manner, the, the, the payment, the multi hop payment is, is uh, settled. And now Cat can just open the, the value X, because he knew it at the beginning, pull the money from, from Bob. And now Bob takes this X and gets the money from, from Alice, get the one coin from Alice. And as I said before, this uh, has time lock contract ensures that Bob cannot gain or lose money in the process. This is the, the point where we started our research and our contribution is that we are looking at these payment channel networks and we are trying to look and to define first which are the security and privacy notions of interest that we need in these networks. We analyze the privacy of current payment channel networks and provide a solution for the issues that they have. We also study the issues of concurrency with the current payment channel networks. Finally, I will show you a, a little of numbers of a prototype that we have for, for our system. So let's start with the security part of it. So we consider two security properties. Uh, one is called balance security. The main idea here is that a payment chain network must ensure that every honest note in the, in the path from the sender to the receiver should not lose coins. So it should not be the case that if delta here is the balance of the channels that the user has with other guys, with other nodes in the network, so not be the case that his balance, his net balance is 10, and after the payment he lost one coin. So now his balance is one coin less. The other security property that we require is cellular ability. And intuitively, it means that the effect in the network caused by any subset of concurrent successful payments should be the same as if we take equivalent execution of those concurrent payments, but we make them sequential. These two, uh, this, um, these two ways of executing payments, concurrent or sequential, should have exactly the same, the same outcome. The, from the privacy point of view, we also consider two privacy properties that we need in the, in the payment chain networks. The first is called value privacy. And intuitively, it means that um, the attacker who is not participating in the path should not be able to figure out which is the amount of credit is actually transacted in the path. He observes that if the attacker is actually in the path, there is not much that we can do because the attacker should know how much money is being routed in order to send it to the next node in the path. Another property that we are after is called relationship anonymity. And the idea here is that even if the attacker is actually in the path, um, the attacker should not be able to figure out which is the actual sender that is paying to, to uh, which actual sender is paid to which actual receiver. Okay? Uh, so imagine, just to clarify, so imagine that we have a set of senders, a set of receivers, all of them are paying at the same time to one of the receivers, so the attacker should not be able to figure out which sender is actually paying to which receiver out there. So we looked at the privacy of payment channel networks, and at first glance it seems that there is no actually a problem, right? So all the payments uh, happen off-chain, and all the, all the forward of coins are happening off-chain, so what is actually the privacy issue here? It uh, turns out that this is actually a privacy problem. Is that the, the main problem is that if you have noticed these has time lock contracts, these conditional payments, use exactly the same condition on each of, of the hops in the, in the path. That means that uh, looking at that condition, it's easy to figure out which uh, channels have been used in, in a path, and also eventually figure out which sender is paying to which receiver. So in the light of this problem, we are trying to propose a solution to solve this privacy problem. And we consider a setting in which uh, uh, there is a peer-to-peer -peer network. And that means that every user only knows the channels with uh, his neighbors in the network. And our main goal is to have as less impact as possible on-chain. That means that we want to have only the standard has time lock contracts as defined in the little network and take all the rest of crypto, all the rest of operations that we need and take it off-chain. In that manner, we don't put overhead on the, on the blockchain, and we, are full uh, we have full compatibility with the current Bitcoin script. The solution that we propose is called Fulgor. I don't have time to show you all the details, but I'm going to tell you which is the key operations that we have there, which is called multi-hop uh, has time lock contract. For, for this new contract, we built, uh, we use a building block which is called non-interactive zero knowledge, uh, which is going to be instantiated by Sikibu, for those of you who, who know. And the idea is depicted in this example here. So now Al is going to create two pairs of values, two pairs of X and Y. 
X0, and Y0 is just created as the hash of X0. Now, X, Y1 is created as the hash of the XOR of X0 and, X, and X1, okay? Now, the first thing that Alice does is send X0 and Y0 to, to the cat. Now the cat can verify, actually, if, if uh, Alice is not cheating, if the Y0 is actually the hash of X0. Another thing that Alice needs to do is to send to the intermediary user, in this case Bob, the value X, X1, the two conditions in the channel, Y0 and Y1, and a proof of the fact that, look, Bob, I'm not going to tell you exactly what is X0, but that exists, an X0 says that if you take that and XOR with X1 and create the hash of it, this is the condition for Y1, and the hash of X0 is the condition for Y0. Obviously, this is done in zero knowledge, so Bob doesn't learn the value of X0. Also, the non-interactive knowledge allows Bob to verify that this proof that Alice is sending is actually verified, is actually correct. Now, when they have this information, um, Alice can start performing the, can perform the conditional payments in the path. So first, Alice will create the conditional payment on condition Y1 with one coin to Bob. And then Bob will forward this uh, one coin to Cat, but instead of using Y1, he will use Y0 this time, in this case. Now, when they are in this setting, the privacy that we get intuitively uh, comes from the fact that now this Y0 and Y1 are not the same, and they're computation distinguishable from two random numbers. So pretty much it, for anybody else, looks like any two random numbers that have been used for, for the conditions in the payment. Now that we have the conditions settled, we need to, to open them. So the first thing that happens is that Cat will open X0. So he, Cat can pull the money from Bob in the channel. And now Bob can take this X0, XOR with X1 that he knows, and pull the money from, from Alice. In this, in, this, uh, in this manner, everybody will set or will get the coins that, uh, that the conditional payment will, was asking for. So from security point of view, the idea is that um, the soundness of the uh, non-interactive zero knowledge uh, ensures that Bob doesn't lose coins. This intuitively means that looking at the zero knowledge, Bob is convinced that the, of the relation between Y1 and Y0. And the zero knowledge part of the, of the proof ensures that Bob doesn't learn X0 on his own. The only way for Bob to learn X0 is that actually the cat reveals that to him. Yep. This is uh, one detail I haven't mentioned here is that as you have seen, Alice have to now have to tell some information to the intermediate guys in the path. If we do it naively, obviously that will reveal who is the sender of the payment. So instead we can use anonymous channel between them. And for example, we can use the implementation of a Sphinx to do, to do this anonymous channel communication. The second part that we are studying is concurrency in payment channel networks. And here we observe that concurrency in the on-chain transa on -chain transaction is uh, somewhat easy to solve, right? So miners have the view of all transactions that happen in the network. They can just take some of them, sort them or order them, put them in the block. So the miners can solve the, the, the concurrency problem in on-chain payments. The problem is that now in off-chain payments, we don't have, or no user in the network has the complete view of all payments that happen in the network. We don't have an entity that can look at all the payments and sort them. So concurrency is not trivial in such an off-chain off setting. So the, the approach that most of the systems out there are using is a blocking solution. Blocking solution means that the users will try a payment, continue the path, and as soon as they reach a channel that doesn't have enough credit, the payment will be aborted. And then um, the payment will be aborted and all the conditional payments will just uh, time out or will just expire. However, such blocking solution can lead to deadlocks. And here's uh, one example. So it might be a bit more complicated network than the one depicted here. Now the red payment means that Alice wants to pay to Gabriel let's say one coin, and Bob wants to pay to Edward, also one coin. For the sake of the example, in mind that each channel has capacity for only one, one payment, okay? So concurrent, concurrent payments will be routed, will use different paths. It can happen the case that now the blue payment goes to Carol, and Carol cannot forward it to Edward because she has used already her coins for the red payment. And now the red payment has reached Fabi, but Fabi cannot forward it to Gabriel because she has used her coins already for the blue payment. Using a blocking solution, both payments now get aborted because there is not enough credit. 
and both payments will be released, and none of them succeed, actually. So what we propose is a non-blocking solution that we call Rayo, and the property that we are after is that um, in, this, in the presence of a set of concurrent payments, we want that at least one of them actually finishes, or actually succeeds. And the main idea is that we want to use, or we use global transaction identifiers. It means that for every transaction, there is an identifier that every node in the network knows. That manner, when we go to a situation like before, imagine that now the blue payment has an identifier T1, the red payment has an identifier T2. Now, every user in the network can locally check, can locally order these two transactions. For example, imagine that the policy that we implement is that uh, payments with the lower identifier get aborted. So now, Caro locally can check that blue payment has to be aborted, but not the red payment. So the, the blue payment gets aborted. Fabi locally can check that uh, the red payment doesn't have to be aborted, so the blue one will be aborted at some moment. She just waits for, for it to be, to be aborted. Now, when the, the coins for the blue payment are actually released, the channel between Fabi and, Gra and Gabriel is, is released, is freed, and now Fabi can forward the red payment to, to Gabriel. In that manner, we make sure that at least one payment, probably the one with, in this example, the one with the highest uh, transaction identifier, actually finishes, finishes as expected from, from the center. Um, if, if you have noticed, I have said before, like, look, Pedro, um, you have said that this uh, global identifier, the Y value before, as I have presented, this global identifier allows to break uh, sender and receiver anonymity or privacy of the payment. So, and now you're proposing to have global identifiers again. Is that, isn't that a problem, actually? And the answer is obviously yes. And what we show in the paper is that it's an in inherent problem. It's impossible to have a non-blocking solution and a, full or a solution that has full privacy or strong privacy. So there is an inherent trade-off, and the system that we have to propose, they have to give up in one or, or the other, or weak one of either um, concurrency or privacy. In the last, in the last two minutes I have left, uh, let me show you which is the, uh, the numbers that we have for our systems. So we have prototyped our system, and we have seen that the running time is uh, largely dominated by the non-interactive zero-knowledge. I've seen that the, fact, the creation of a proof requires around 300 milliseconds, while the verification of the proof requires 130 milliseconds. And the size of one of the proofs that we need is uh, a bit more than 1.6 uh, uh, megabytes. In order to test a more realistic scenario, we have taken a, a payment with five hops, and we have tested with a non-private version of the uh, uh, implementation of the Lightning Network. In our setting, it takes a bit more than 600 uh, milliseconds. And to compare, we have implemented our privacy preserving solution, and it takes a, lead, a little less than two seconds, and we need, in total, five megabytes of communication between the nodes in the path. The main point here is, as I said before, like all these zero knowledge, all these computations are meant of chain, and we don't require to put any extra information in the transactions. So these proofs are not actually included in the blockchain, they just pass off chain among the, the users in the path. So to conclude, I would like to say that um, in this work we define security and privacy properties of interest in a payment chain network. We have shown that there is an inherent, uh, an inherent trade off between concurrency and privacy and the system that we build, they will have to look at that uh, trade off and give up in one of the two. Uh, given that actually we propose two systems or two approaches to handle this concurrency and privacy. One is called Fulgor and the other is called Rayo. In Fulgor, we go for full privacy, but uh, blocking solution. While in Rayo, we go for full concurrency, or non-blocking solution, while we have a weaker notion of privacy. Finally, we saw that our solutions are efficient. Uh, they are compatible with the current Bitcoin script, and as I have said before, they don't require any storage overhead in the, in the blockchain. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Yep, I hit. Um, 
I can I cannot hear, so can you speak up, please? Yeah, where 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 sorry was the question coming? There. Okay. Hey, um, so you were commenting on mm -hmm. the privacy of the payment channel and a in a multi-hop payment. Mm -hmm. And Lightning Network uses onion routing so that the information of the next hop is actually only revealed to the hop that is uh, getting it. And uh, the route is set by the sender. Yep. So I'm wondering what is the supposed thread model here where privacy is leaked when the information is only shared with the participant of the route already. So um, that's not clear to me. Um, I'm not sure I understood your question entirely, but um, so what we use to send information among the users in the path, we use uh, the same technique as in the Lightning Network, in the sense that we use this onion routing to send these uh, zero knowledge proofs and these X values. Um, and the privacy leak that we said here is that even if you send information only to the users in the path and they get only their information, the conditional payment requires this Y value, which is the same among all the users. So the threat model that we consider is that if there are two users that collude in the path, they can figure out that they are actually performing or they are part of the same path. But they can already do that just by the amount and the timing. That's uh, definitely true. Um, so what we consider is that, okay, let's imagine two payments uh, that has the same, uh, the same amount and uh, the timing is similar. So even then, you ha the, uh, the condition in the payment will leak, will leak who is paying to whom. But totally agree, like uh, we need to extend this to also hide the amount and also uh, hide the leak by, by the timing as well, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think. Um, so when you were talking about the method of communication from the sender to all of the people who get the intermediate uh, values for Fulgor, you kind of uh, brushed over it by saying they could use a Sphinx network. I, I was wondering if you could go into more depth into that. Okay, so um, the, in the paper we kind of abstract away from, from the routing mechanism in the sense that uh, we assume that the, every user in the path can take a look of the whole network topology. So every channel is publicly open in the in the network in the in the on, in the blockchain. So the sender can figure out the path on his own, and now he just can use the onion routing to to the nodes that he picks in the path. And uh, we can use any onion routing mechanism. We just use Sphinx because it has been shown to be more efficient than others. But our techniques are basically <coughs> independent or orthogonal to the actual onion routing that you use. Uh, so uh, I didn't show it in this work, but we are in a parallel work that we are doing. We are looking exactly at the routing problem or the routing mechanism, and we are looking at uh, what would be the, the best routing strategy, or can we have different routing strategies? So uh, we, there we looked at uh, something like Sphinx, like onion routing. We are looking at uh, Landman routing, which is another technique, um, and we have uh, we have tested, it, implemented them, and tested with real data from another network. And we propose another protocol there is called Speedy Murmurs, and this will be presented in NDSS this year. But I thought that like, it's an interesting problem, but just looking at another, another paper I, I didn't present here. Yeah. Got time for one more really fast question. I, I cannot hear from here, sorry. Ah, plus size. Uh, yeah. Ah, definitely. Uh, so the here we have using the implementation of Sikibu. Um, we have talked to to the authors, and they are working on on a better, uh, improved solution. They call it Sikibu plus plus. And now we are looking at into testing that. Um, even now in the paper, they claim that the proofs are even smaller. So even with better implementations, can definitely go 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 lower indeed. That's, that's true. 
And uh, one last thing in the last five seconds. Like here we just uh, see Kibu, but uh, our implementation is uh, needs a non-interactive zero knowledge with certain properties. So if tomorrow there is a, another implementation which is, uh, has le lower proofs and achieves still the same properties, we can still use it actually. That's, that's the point. Great, thank you, Pedro. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're figuring this out on the fly. So uh, to make questions easier, we're gonna have a mic over on the aisle there. So if you wanna ask questions in the talk, please come line up over there so we can do this quickly and make sure everyone gets heard. Um, and okay, now we already have Ian. Ian Myers. Okay, so yes, my name's Ian Myers. Uh, just got my PhD under Matt Green from Hopkins, one of the authors of Zero Coin, Zero Cash, and one of the founding scientists at Zcash. So my interest in, in Bitcoin and how I got, first got involved was dealing with the privacy aspect of it. Of course, it wouldn't surprise you that there's also a scaling problem, I assume, since you read the title of this conference, you're aware of that. And sort of the bottom line, all right, so converting these to PDFs doesn't actually work out very well. Um, the bottom line on, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so the bottom line is that scaling, uh, you know, blockchain-based payments have scaling issues. They're uh, expensive in terms of resources, in terms of uh, money, resource usage, and uh, just time, right? It's high latency. And this is a problem that is kind of annoying. This thing that's the next generation of payments that we're supposed to use is actually expensive. And... This really should, well that, there, okay. The thing we're supposed to use is expensive and that's a pain, but this is actually something we're familiar with. Anyone who's tried to buy a drink at a bar has had to deal with a payment processing system that has fees associated with it and has some you know, time involvement that you don't want to deal with. And so the solution we have to this, right, is that you basically batch the payments together, right? If you're in a bar, right, you open a bar tab. And at the beginning of the night, you know, the two ways this works. Either you give them your credit card, and as you're buying drinks, you build up this uh, tally debt, and at the end of the night, they run the credit card, right? This happens if the bartender uh, doesn't trust you, right? If the bartender does trust you, well, then you just have to keep putting them on your tab, and at the end of the night, you give them the credit card, and they run it. But in either case, you end up with a, we have amortized the cost of uh, this expensive payment, right, whether it's in this case a credit card or a blockchain-based payment, over multiple transactions. And so this is sort of the basic idea of behind a payment channel. But the difference is that in uh, the bar setting, you know, there's some trust going on. But what happens if you don't trust anybody, right? How do you possibly get this to work, right? And so the protocol, sort of the way you want to think about payment channels, is that there's sort of a protocol for IOUs. And I don't mean this in this sort of credit network sense. I mean this in terms of just the ones where you actually have some money involved, right? So if you don't trust the bartender and the bartender doesn't trust you, then what you would like to do is, at the beginning of the night, you give the bartender 100 bucks, and then he gives you an IOU for $95 and one beer, because the beer costs $5. And if you want to make another purchase, right, what you do is you go up, you take the IOU for $95, you show it to him, and he goes, okay, clearly I have $95 of your money, and you exchange that for an IOU for $90 and another beer. So we're sort of just you know, tweaking this thing back and forth. And you can keep doing this as much as you want. And at the end of the night, right, when you're done, you have to go cash out the IOU. And this should work as a payment protocol. Of course, the question is, who do you cash out the IOU with, right? If you do it with the uh, bartender, then you still got to trust the bartender. We haven't gotten anything here, right? And so this is where this analogy breaks down, right? But the answer to this, of course, is a blockchain because, right, blockchains always sort of pay their debts. You can actually do this with an escrowed uh, escrow mechanism, right? You lock your money on the, on the blockchain in one payment that costs some resources, and then you make a bunch of payments, and then later come back and close the channel, right? So this is one way to think of how Lightning and other payment system, payment channel networks work, is put some money in, do a bunch of transactions, and then put it out, right? So this is nothing new. This is, you know, not, not my work here. This is the basics of this thing. But the question that, you know, sort of comes up is, what does this do for privacy, right? So this is back to my actual research. And it turns out that not just does this not really give you a huge amount of privacy, it actually maybe makes the situation worse. Um, because if you have an individual payment channel, 
right? The channel is linkable. If you go to the bar and you say, I have a channel, here's the payment, right? And you, make another, you buy another bar, beer and you buy another beer. You have to actually identify the transaction you put on the blockchain at the start of the channel. And so you, you end up identifying yourself. And if that's the bar, that's not a problem. But if you're trying to use this to do micropayments to avoid advertising, to pay for bandwidth and like Tor, you identify yourself every time you do this, you build up this pattern of, of what you're doing, right? It becomes a long-lived pseudonym. So you don't want to do that. So you can't use it for some applications. Worse, right, it doesn't actually solve the other problem with Bitcoin, you know, it has a privacy problem, that everything that's on the blockchain is public, right? You'd think because we've removed these individual transactions, we've gained something. And that's true, but the frequent thing that you worry about is actually the aggregate data, right? It doesn't matter if I'm telling you that I'm paying a psychiatrist every, month, every week for $500. It matters if you know that I'm paying the psychiatrist regularly at all. And so if I open a channel every month with Acme Psychiatric Services and then close it at the end of the month, that's sort of the information you need. The situation does get better if you have payment channel now. Right, where you have these, as people have talked about, you have these network of hop from hop, hop to hop to hop to hop, and you can do this sort of onion routing style thing. Because then all anyone sees is that you have a channel open with the particular uh, entry point. However, in that case, there are a couple of problems. First of all, the hubs in the network learn what you're doing, right? Um, and this causes a bunch of issues, right? Because it's not really clear what these channel networks are going to look like. The hope, right, is you get this decentralized network of everybody. Even in this, you still have some problems, as was alluded to in the Q&A, right, um, in the last talk. If you have a path through the network and all of, your, all of the peers on the path collude, they can identify you, right? They can do this via direct collusion. They can do this via correlation after the fact, right? You don't really get strong privacy from this model. But even worse, if you end up in this setting, which might well happen where the thing is completely centralized, then you don't even have to worry about collusion or after the fact stuff. This guy just knows everything you're doing. And this poses a bunch of problems, right? Uh, right? Because this starts to look exactly like what we have now for payment technology, which is sort of unsatisfactory to a for a number of us in terms of privacy, right? You end up with one basically centralized payment provider or one or two, and they can see everything you're doing. Right? And they, in fact, have you know, started doing like monetization stuff, and there's no reason to think that wouldn't happen in the other case. Right? And then the situation gets a little worse for Bitcoin because it's not likely to be some regulated or vaguely regulated entity like Visa or financial institutions, which have admittedly thin but rules on what they can do with your personal data. It's going to be, insert your favorite sketchy exchange here. I redacted this to not offend anyone in particular, so you can all be offended equally. Um, but it's going to be someone here with no existing regulatory framework. They may not be based in a jurisdiction you like. You have no control over what they do, right? And this is just if it's centralized, right? Again, there's a privacy problem even if it's not with collusion and everything else, right? And so the reality of the matter uh, is that centralized lightning, at least, might actually be worse privacy-wise than Bitcoin, right? I'm not so sure about the decentralized case. Because in Bitcoin, you have multiple identities, and they're basically free to create and your identities can be ephemeral, right? On the other hand, in Lightning, your identities are costly. In order to create a channel, you have to put money in, you have to escrow it, and that's $10, $100, $1,000, but it's a cost per thing, right? Your identities are long-lived. The entire point of the protocol is to amortize the cost of making one on, or two blockchain on-chain payments over a number of transactions. So yes, you can open a channel, make one transaction, close the channel, but then you've actually just made three blockchain-based payments and when you could have made one. So there was no game there, right? Finally, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, depending on what happens with the laws, the hubs may need your actual real identity, right? There may be KYC or AML laws that go into these things. And even if there's not, right, again, it's a long-term pseudonym. Uh, and it's quite easy to figure out and link these to your actual real-world identity, right? You use the payment channel network once to make a payment to Amazon and they ship you a product, well, now someone knows the linkage on this stuff if they collude, right? And so the interesting thing here is that opening channels with anonymous funds, whether you were to add Lightning uh, to Zcash or to use uh, CoinJoin or some kind of mixnet to get you get, get privacy in Bitcoin, doesn't solve these issues, right? Because you still have long-term pseudonyms that build up profiles of what you're doing, right? So Bitcoin plus Lightning isn't private. Um, and even if Bitcoin itself was private, 
right, or you had something like Zcash that, that has privacy, right, if you compose that with Lightning, you actually lose privacy in a certain sense. So this is where we sort of get into my work. Um, and this is Bolt. So Bolt is a set of uh, protocols for privacy-preserving uh, payment channels. There's sort of three different versions of it. I'm only going to go into the middle one in this talk. There is a unidirectional channel, which allows Alice to send fixed denominations of money to Bob after establishing uh, a channel with escrowed funds. This is based on compact eCash. There are actually some sort of cool tricks here that you can use to transform any compact eCash scheme into uh, such a channel. And then there is a bidirectional scheme that allows Alice and Bob to exchange arbitrary values in either direction of money. Uh, and this is based on fair exchange, blind signatures, and zero knowledge proofs. And then finally, there is a third party payment protocol that allows you to do, as you see in Lightning, you know, chained payment networks, right? Where you go from one party to another to another, right? So this avoids the fact that you have to have a channel opened with everyone you want to interact with. You can only have them opened with one central party or a network of parties, right? So how do you do this? Right? Well, first of all, you have to stop and think about what the privacy in the setting means. Unlike in uh, Bitcoin or Zcash, where we can say a payment, if I make it, we would hope that no one can tell who it came from at all, in channel networks, there is this requirement that you have to have an open channel, right? If I'm a bartender and someone comes and pays me, says put it on my tab, I have some notion that they already opened a tab with me. Right? And so that limits the anonymity set. It's not the case that it could be some random person on the other side of the world. It has to have been someone who already interacted with me to open a channel. So this sort of limits this. The other subtle point is that in the setting where you only have point-to-point -point channels, the one end of the channel sort of has to be a known pseudonym. The reason for this is if it wasn't, if someone used a random identifier, you'd have no guarantees that anyone else had channels opened with them. Right? And so you're, you'd be anonymous out of the set of people who have channels open with this one guy, but that turns out to just be you. So every time you use the channel, he knows it's you. But when you move to the payment channel network setting, this gets a little better. And so you end up something that looks intuitively like what you'd want. Right, so how do you do this? Right, the problem is you want to exchange an IOU. And again, I don't mean this in a way of like a credit network. I mean this like, a, like an actual like one you can cash out. Um, worth $100 for one worth $95 and one beer, right? You're making a purchase. But if we want to do this in a privacy-preserving way, you cannot tell the, the person who purchased it from, the bartender, that the IOU is for 100 bucks because it might not be $100. It might be some uniquely identifying value, $105.21, for example, right? Similarly, you can't tell them what the existing, the new IOU is worth because that would leak the same thing. And we can't even show you the actual IOU because that has someone's signature on it, and that also uniquely identifies the person, right? And yet somehow, I really do have to prove to you, I had an IOU from you for 100 bucks because I put this in the, the money in the channel. And you are now signing an IOU for 50 bucks uh, or $95, whatever the payment value is. Um, but you don't actually know the values involved. You just know that it differed by five bucks, right, that you got paid. And the funny thing is, that sounds hard. But it actually isn't even cryptographic with the hard part. If you know a little bit of cryptography, right, this actually becomes pretty simple, right? You need uh, commitments and zero knowledge proofs, um, which work out pretty well. But, and so with those, you can actually transform a setting where you have an IOU for uh, $100, right? The merchant is owed zero, the, the customer is owed 100, and you want to basically exchange it for a signature where the merchant is owed uh, five and the customer is owed 95. This is the sort of the trade you want to do, but you want to do this without revealing any of this stuff. And it actually becomes pretty simple because all you have to do, why are we skipping? Uh, yeah. All you have to do is use, do a zero knowledge proof that look, this thing exists, right? It ha I'm not going to tell you the balance and here is the new thing that differs by $5. So this is sort of the magic of zero knowledge proof so you can get this to work. However, I said that's not even the hard part, right? The hard part is that you can't have both these IOUs be valid at the same time, right? If I have an IOU for $100 and I have an IOU for $95, right, and you've already given me the beer, then I can go cash out the $100 one and I've gotten a free beer, right? Insert GIF of Homer Simpson going, woo, free beer, right? And so you need to somehow swap these two out, right? But if you invalidate the IOU for $100 first before you get the new one, then you have no guarantee you can get your money back, right? Alice can't be sure that she can go close the thing because she has no valid IOU. On the other hand, right, if you do what I just said, you, you give the IOU for 95 first, well, before validating the $100 one, well, then you can cheat the person. 
And so this sounds concerning, because really what you want to do is an atomic swap from we have this IOU that's valid to we have this IOU that's valid, and now this one's invalid. And that's actually hard to do in crypt cryptographically, right? And so the trick here is that it turns out that the IOUs actually are not, um, they serve two functions, and they're not entirely the same, right? So the first function the IOU serves is it allows you to cash out uh, your money from the blockchain, right? It's last call, it's the end of the night, you want the money you put in back, and, and that's fine, right? So that's function one. Function two is you want to be able to buy an, another beer, right? And the IOU does not have to be valid for both of these at the same time, right? Even if you can't buy another I, a beer with your IOU, it's inconvenient, but you can always get your money back. And then if you really wanted to, you know, you can go restart the process, open a new one that's valid, right? So this isn't that much of a problem. And so this means that Alice can actually safely give up her ability to buy another beer without risking losing money. And Bob, the bartender, can actually safely sign a new IOU for $95 um, if Alice still has the ability to close the other one. He just can't give her the beer yet and can't give her the ability to go purchase more beers with it. And so the protocol actually ends up looking like something pretty simple. If you have your two IOUs, right? Right, this is your old one, uh, it was for like $100, and you're trying to make a transaction for five, right? You create both of these, you want the bartender to sign the new one and give you a beer. So the first thing you do is you produce this and you prove that this one is related correctly. Um, and you reveal an identifier on the old IRU. This is to prevent you from replaying what's going on. And then you uh, actually get the bartender to sign the new IRU as being valid for closing the channel. So this is fine because you have no payments actually gone through, you've just basically given them $5, right? Now, once you have the safe new one, you can destroy the old IRU. You do this by sort of revoking the old one. You basically sign using under this identifier a statement saying this IRU is no longer valid. And so what would happen is if you ever tried to close with this one, the bartender could pick this up and go, hey, look, I can prove to the network that you actually, this was stale, right? Once that's done, he can safely give you the new IRU that allows you to purchase a new beer. Right, and this, doing this gives you complete privacy, right? So this is not a theoretical thing. We actually implemented this. Um, the details of cryptographic primitives are not particularly interesting. It takes one to two seconds to do the crypto to set up a channel. It takes less than 100 milliseconds per hop to make a payment. Um, this doesn't use ZK snarks, right? There's sort of a misconception in the Bitcoin and Ethereum communities that ZK snarks are synonymous with zero knowledge proofs. Uh, as I think a talk later today is gonna get to, that's actually not the case. And this, there's no trusted setup, there's no nothing here. Um, and you can actually do this with rather well-established cryptography. So this is nice, this is reasonably scalable. Um, and by the way, the signatures on this are quite small. I don't have the exact numbers out of my head, but they are in the paper. Um, so as an extension, you can in fact do more than just simple payments where you just have a bartender and a, someone trying to get a beer. You can do payment networks over multiple hops. And this actually hides the participants from each other and the intermediaries. And this actually also sidesteps the issues you saw with uh, Lightning and payment channel networks and Bitcoin about collusion and identification. Right? It doesn't have this problem. Um, and it hides everything from the blockchain. Payment value, participants, everything. Right? The only thing that's left is the, maybe a timing side channel, which is harder to get around. Um, incidentally, you can also do this for, for more sophisticated things than just monetary balances. Right? You can remember I sort of had this proof. We have an a, uh, IOU for A, we're going to go to an IOU for B, and we're going to prove that it differs by $5. Well, that's one constraint you could prove. If you want to make an arbitrary state transition on something that's com complicated, you want to do something like plasma, you can do this. Um, also, you can remove any exotic crypto from the blockchain if you want to add one more round trip to the protocol. You just have to validate a signature, standard ECDSA signature, and the opening of a commitment. So how do you deploy them? Well, sorry. Got ahead of myself. So one thing I'd like to do is to compare this to uh, related work, uh, Tumblebit, Lightning, uh, everything else, right? So the difference is that Tumblebit and the Lightning payments, of course, work in Bitcoin as is, right? They don't offer you privacy from a uh, hub if it colludes with the other people in the network, right? In Lightning, if everybody in your payment channel, you know, colludes, or even actually in Lightning today, the two endpoints, you get identified. There's this, right? Uh, in Tumblebit, if the uh, hub and the re receiver collude, they can identify the sender. Um, in Bolt, uh, this is not the case, right? You get full privacy, but you do it at the cost of uh, having to actually tweak what happens, right? So how do you deploy this? Um, 
Right? It ends up being the case that you can deploy this in Zcash or in Bitcoin by just adding a new opcode. Uh, whether this is a soft fork or a hard fork, I've long since stopped actually paying too much attention to those, that stuff, so uh, interesting discussion. Um, but you can do it by adding an opcode. Um, and the one caveat to this is that in Bitcoin, right, uh, you need to be able to anonymize the funding of the channel. Because in order to get this protocol to work, the one cheat that makes this efficient is that it's a two-party protocol where you're doing exchanges back and forth. And so there is this possibility that you can end up aborting in the middle of the protocol. The network goes dead, someone maliciously does this, it doesn't matter. And you can end up in an invalid state where you have to close the channel, right? And when you close the channel, right, that you can link the closure of the channel to that abort, right? Which means you can link one individual payment, only one, the last one you made on the channel to the opening of the channel, right? And in some cases, you know, if you're using this to avoid getting a profile of what pages you view on the New York Times, that might not be that bad. In some cases, it would be. And in those cases, you want to make sure that if they link it to the channel opening, that tells them nothing about who you are, right? So, okay, you fund the channel opening anonymously, and this solves your problems. Um, so that's Bolt. It's a provably secure, strongly private payment channel, so it can be deployed on top of uh, Zcash or Bitcoin if you're willing to add an opcode. Uh, and with that, I'll take questions. So if you've got questions, please, please come up here. Let's uh, get everything into the mic. Can you talk a little bit about the requirements to store the revocation keys and uh, what what a large merchant, such as a large online retailer, might uh, need to build an infrastructure to deal with that? So it's going to be something like 32 bytes per uh, user per channel. So you have to store it. It's a, it's a small amount of data, but you do have to store it, and you have to monitor the network to make sure they're not closing the channel channels in a way where you have to, because you have to go dispute them if they close them. So your infrastructure is you've got to store what I'd at least consider to be a small amount of data per client, and then you've got to be online and able to monitor the network to make sure that someone doesn't close a channel out from under you. So uh, any kind of expiration of the IOUs is just internal. Uh, to the merchant's uh, deal with the customer? Uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a timeout. As in Lightning, those, you have to pick some timeout parameters on how long someone has to wait before you post a closure. Sorry, when you post a closure, there's some amount of time we have to wait to allow the other person to dispute it. Uh, and then after that, if you haven't disputed it, the money pulls out, and so you want to figure out, given <laughs> the amounts of money involved, the reliability of your infrastructure, how long that timeout is. That's a tunable parameter you can set per merchant. Thank you. Hello. Um, could you talk a little bit about the opcode that's needed and what it does? So you need to add an opcode that looks at, it's a little weird, you look at the output of a transaction and you want to, you're going to get a commitment that's the IOU, it opens, and you want to check that uh, the balance and the funds coming in is split according to that, uh, the value in that commitment. So this percent goes to the merchant, this percent goes to the customer, and then you have to validate that it's actually signed under the correct key. Um, okay. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ian. Our, our next presenter is Tim Ruffing from Sarlin University. He's gonna be talking about Value Shuffle, a protocol that achieves comprehensive privacy by combining confidential transactions, stealth addresses, and coin mixing into a single solution. Thank you. Uh, 
full screen. <laughs> Okay, so uh, my name is Tim. This is joint work with uh, with Pedro, who actually was uh, who gave the first talk in the session. And uh, yeah, we we've seen two talks now about uh, putting privacy in layer two, but let's talk about layer one as well. So because I claim we still don't have privacy in layer one. So the the title of this talk is Value Shuffle Mixing Confidential Transactions. Okay, and I, I guess I, I don't have to. Uh, convince you that Bitcoin at the moment is not really private, so uh, there are a lot of uh, possibilities to link, for example, addresses together to de-anonymize people. We've seen work from, from academia, from the, from the community, uh, there are even tools to do that automatically, and nowadays we even have companies who provide de-anonymization as a service, so obviously that's, that's not great for privacy. Um, one very simple way to uh, break some of the linkability or break some of the denomination attacks is, is coin join. And the um, idea is, let's say we have a, a few users, Alice, Bob, Charlie here, for example, and uh, let's for really let's take really the simple case. They have all one Bitcoin each, and uh, they want to to get some some anonymity and. Uh, they do a simultaneous transactions by sending their, their coins to fresh addresses of their own. So, for example, Alice takes a new address, A prime, and uh, participates in this coin join transaction, and then Alice gets uh, some degree of anonymity. Because if you look at the, at the new uh, output address, A prime, then an observer can't tell whether it belongs to, to Alice, Bob, or Charlie. Um, to, to do that, we need the, uh, to do this contract transaction. We need a mixed list of those fresh addresses, and um, it's it's not uh, trivial to come up with that because uh, if you if you would do the naive thing, I mean, Alice could just say, okay, let's do a coin join. My new address is a prime. Of course, it wouldn't be private because they uh, Alice, Bob, and Charlie are just random users. They they don't trust each other, right? So we need a, a way to come up with this mixed list of, of fresh addresses and. Uh, the, the cryptographic primitive, basically, that we need here is called peer-to-peer -peer mixing. And uh, to explain you what, what Value Shuffle actually does, we first have to look at one of those peer-to-peer -peer mixing protocols. And this is uh, actually also work we did, uh, also me, Pedro, and together with, uh, with our advisor, Aniket, who's also in the audience. This was presented at NDSS. Um, so the idea is we have... Um, we have a few users, let's, let's say four here, they all have a message. Uh, in this case, the messages are the, the output addresses. And what they want to do is they want to come up with a, a mixed or anonymized, an anonymized list of those messages. And, and also, in, in some sense, they want to agree on this, on this list of output addresses or messages. And in our case, if you combine this with CoinJoin, it's, the agreement is just signing the CoinJoin transaction, okay? And this works in a peer-to-peer -peer trust model. So those users, they, they don't trust each other. Um, and there also, there are no uh, external anonymity routers, like in Tor, for example, or anything. Only thing we have, we, we, we require a bulletin board, but it's just used for communication. So the only thing it does, it relays messages, and we don't trust it for anonymity. And so if, uh, and if, if some of those users are malicious, and they can be, obviously, um, then what you want is that the anonymity set is the uh, set of the honest users that remains. So of course, if, if Alice and Dave are, are malicious here, then uh, Bob and Charlie can only, um, or Carol actually, it's, ah, <laughs> it's Carol, whatever. So Bob and Carol can only be anonymous among each other. And uh, we also want the property that the protocol must terminate even in the presence of malicious users. So there shouldn't be a single user who just is able to, to stop the protocol for everybody. And um, this is actually a hard problem because uh, if you look at those protocols, they usually have the property that if, if there's one user who just sends random garbage, for example, Dave here just uh, doesn't adhere to the protocol and, and sends some random shit, then what happens is that every, all of the messages are destroyed. No, so not just Dave's message goes away, but all of the messages goes away. And this obviously stops the others from, from completing the protocol. And the, the naive thing we, we or the, the real idea we can have is okay, let's let's kick out this disrupting user and start from scratch. But the, the problem usually is that the protocols still provide anonymity. So you know the protocol has been disrupted, but you don't know who disrupted it, just because the protocol provides anonymity. And um, 
how we how we overcome this is uh, just simple in case of description we break anonymity. And this sounds sounds bad at first glance. Um, however, I, ca I can tell you why this is not a problem. So and to to understand it, we can just look at, have a look at the flowchart of of dice mix here com combined with coin join, and this is by the way then called what what we call coin shuffle plus plus this combination. So as a user in the beginning, you, you generate a fresh output address. This is the, the address where you send, want to send the money to. And then you try to do the mixing. And then you, after the mixing, you check uh, whether the mixing has been disrupted. And if it has been, uh, sorry, if it has not been disrupted, then you could just go ahead and sign the contract transaction. And then we are done. That's easy. If it has been disrupted, then you break anonymity. For example, by, uh, this works by revealing some uh, ephemeral information. And uh, after you, you uh, break anonymity, you, you discard your output address, so the, the, the output address that you just chosen, and then you, uh, because you have, uh, um, so because anonymity is, um, doesn't hold anymore, you can now exactly determine who disrupted the protocol, you can kick him off and start from scratch. And uh, the cool thing is um, here, if, if you look at it, uh, you, you sign the coin join transaction only if you haven't discarded um, if you haven't discarded the address, which means that um, it's safe to to break the anonymity here for this one address because you you haven't used this address in the past, it, you you won't use it now, and you discarded it. You will never use it in the future. So it's just a random public key, basically. Um, and and you, there's no meaning attached to it. So, and then the next one, you, you take a new one. That's not a problem. And this this works basically because those addresses or public keys are just discardable. You can you can generate a fresh one if if you don't like it, throw it away. Let's start with a new one. And actually, it turns out that this discardability of messages is actually a fundamental. Um, fundamental property of, of those mixing protocols, because we show in, in this paper that um, you can't achieve, or you can't have a peer-to-peer -peer mixing protocol that has anonymity termination and uh, supports fixed messages, and by fixed means uh, non-discardable messages. So basically, uh, we have to give up one of those properties, and in our case, we give up the support for, for the uh, fixed messages just because we don't need it. And then, um, so yeah, the intersection here is empty, and uh, dice mix lies here, so it achieves anonymity and termination. Um, okay, and yeah, and I won't tell you how, how dice mix exactly works because this is not the, the main part of the talk. But let's just assume we have a solution. We have a peer-to-peer -peer mixing protocol, and now we know how to to come up with this uh, list of output addresses in, in in an anonymous way, basically. Okay, and now we we can do mixing. It's great. Um, and actually, it's not. So. Um, yeah, I can tell you why, why mixing actually sucks. And yeah, let's say we have a user, Bob. Bob is a, our average user. Bob wants to mix coins. And uh, the first problem is that, yeah, we have assumed that all participants have the same amount of bitcoins, right? But it's usually not true. So Bob probably has not exactly uh, one bitcoin, so maybe he has 1.2. And of course, we, we can't do mixing or we can't do coin join like that, right? Because this trivially breaks privacy because now it's obvious that a B prime is Bob's new output address. So we can't do that. So maybe we, we can use a change address here. We can try to do that. And um, yeah, it kind of works, but the problem is now Bob has, a, has this 0. Uh, two bitcoins that are not anonymized, and he doesn't know what to do with it, right? Because he can't spend it, because it's it's still linked to his identity, and maybe he could do a new coin join, but then he probably would be left with another exchange address, so it doesn't really solve the problem. Um, yeah. Another another problem is um, Bob could have the idea to uh, to spend uh, the money actually, so in the end you don't want to, to, get an, to only get privacy for your money, you want to spend it, right? So, and we could in try to integrate it in the coin join here. And uh, let's say Bob wants to to pay to some recipient R, and uh, he wants to pay 0 0.5 bitcoins, and now he just adds another change address, right? So we, we can try to do that. However, this is where uh, this discardability of messages comes in, because now Bob's message in the peer-to-peer -peer mixing protocol wouldn't just be the output address B prime, but uh, would also be the amount that he wants to to spend the 0.5 Bitcoin. 
However, this, the 0 0.5 is not discardable, right? It's not like you can abort this run and then in the, sec in the next run uh, try to send a different amount. That's just not what you want. It doesn't work. So we can't do that either. So what, what Bob actually has to, has to do to pay to recipient is to just perform two transactions. So first do the mixing, that's one, what, that's, uh, what's shown on the left. And then after the mixing is completed, he has to, he has to send the money. And even that is not, not great because uh, Bob has now two uh, weird um, change addresses, so B prime prime and B prime prime prime. And he could have the, uh, yeah, first so he needs two transactions, that's bad. And it really sucks because he, um, if he now for some reason has the idea to use these two change addresses together, that actually breaks uh, privacy again, and even it breaks the privacy of the of the past transactions. So if you are looking from the perspective of an observer here, we know that Bob is here uh, for at, at the B prime prime, and then we know Bob is here. We know Bob is here because it's the same input, uh, or it, it's another input in the same transaction. We know then Bob is here, Bob is here, and Bob was here. So by by misusing those those change addresses, basically Bob doesn't only break the uh, the privacy of this last transaction; he actually breaks the privacy of the older transactions. So it's a huge uh, foot cannon basically for Bob. So yeah, bad luck. So he wants to mix coins and uh, but got DNMized. So yeah, and if, if if you look at the core of the problem here, basically is is that the transacted values are are all public. So what the observer can use here. It's basically, yeah, he, he can use um, equations of, of the form like 0 uh, 1.0 plus 0 0.2 is 1.2. So he can just make this, um, see these relations from the transactions. So what, what if we can hide, uh, if, if we could hide those, those public values? And um, there's a proposal to do that. It's called uh, confidential transactions. It's not in Bitcoin, but it, could be possible, and um, it basically works by um, instead of having the amounts on the transactions on plane, they are hidden in homomorphic commitments. So uh, we have a commitment to to a value x and some um, some uh, planning factor, and uh, yeah, the, the property of the commitment basically it hides it hides x, and but you can only open it to uh, to the right x, so you can't create money. And then you can use those commitments just like normal values. You can add them, uh, you can subtract them, and so on. And that's why you can still check the uh, check whether transactions are balanced. That that means that transactions don't create money. So and now, if we if we want to do coin join with confidential transactions, uh, it could look like that, for example. So we have again three users. Now uh, the values are not in public. The values are in the commitments. We have some planning factors. And uh, here in this example. Um, we also have a case where we, we have, where all the, the three users immediately pay to some recipients, and this will be possible. That's why I included here. So A, for example, um, pays to recipient A, R A, and it has a change address A prime as well. And uh, now the um, if, if we had such a transaction, we could send it to the, to the blockchain and verifiers would check if it's, if it's valid. And how do they do that? Well, they, they use the uh, commitments on the left-hand side, add them up, and subtract all the commitments on the, on the right-hand side. And then we have to check whether the final commitment is a commitment to zero, because zero means that the transaction is balanced and no money has been created. And um, in, in confidential transactions, this is basically done by setting the... Um, setting the, the planning factor such that the, re, the uh, resulting sum planning factor, this value r uh, at the bottom, is exactly, is exactly zero. So basically, we have, this, we have this commitment to zero. The, the way to prove that this is a commitment to zero is to reveal r. This would be the simple thing. And CoinJoin does a small optimization. Instead of revealing r, we just set the, the uh, planning factors in the beginning such that they always add up to zero. And then zero is a canonical value, you don't have to send it because it's always zero. Okay. Just the, the problem here is that, um, yeah, the, 
this is easy if, if one user creates a confidential transaction, but now we have uh, one of those transactions, but now we have three users and they don't trust each other. So what they can't do, they can't just reveal their, their uh, random planning factors to each other because this would reveal the values again. So uh, we need uh, to have some other way to, to um, basically um, to, yeah, to, to get this excess value here or the value R. And if you look at it, um, we have to compute the sum of all these um, of all these planning factors. And what we can do is uh, that each user um, takes a sum of, of his values, basically. So if you look at Bob, we, had, we have uh, Bob's planning factor for the input and two for the outputs. And he could just use the input one uh, minus one of the outputs one minus the other of the output one. So this is basically Bob's combined plan planning factor. Alice has a combined planning factor as well, and, and uh, Carol has a combined planning factor as well. And now what we want to do is we want to uh, add up these combined planning factors again, um, but such that the individual summons of the individual users are not revealed. And if we have then this uh, value R, um, and I will explain you uh, how we get this actually, but if we have this value R, then we can just add another uh, additional output to the transaction, which basically is some dummy value with the yeah with the value zero and this planning factor minus r. And then we have again the property that if you add up everything, then the values add up to zero and the planning factors add up to zero. So this is a commitment to zero zero, and this is exactly what's necessary to make the um, to make the confidential transaction valid and to to convince people that uh, this doesn't create money. So um, the only thing we basically need to add to, to our dice mix protocol is, is a so-called secure sum protocol, um, which does exactly what, what, we, what we require here. So basically, uh, every user um, contributes uh, the sum, or every, every user contributes his own pla planning factor, and the protocol computes the sum of the planning factors, but without revealing the individual values. And such protocols uh, exist. They're pretty simple. I won't go into details. Um, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> they're there. So if, if, you, uh, if you then look at the thing that value shuffle is just this, our dice mix protocol combined with such a secure sum protocol. And under the hood, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty nice, actually, because uh, dice mix um, internally uses um, DC nets. I don't know if you heard of it. If not, it, it's not a problem. But DiceMix uses DC nets and also secure some protocols are basically DC nets, so they can be nicely put together in, into one protocol. So um, let's just do one sanity check. So uh, one of the problems was that the messages were not discardable. Um, let's, uh, let's check that we can discard our values here. So let's look at Bob's message in the mixing protocol. Um, Bob's first message is a new output address, B prime. It's, it's, a, it's a commitment to 0 0.7, and it's some auxiliary information, for example, a range proof that's necessary for confidential transactions, which is not very important here. Um, so the change address is discardable. We can just take a new one. Uh, the commitments now are also discardable um, because they are randomized. So uh, if you can throw them away, just say, create a new commitment that's indistinguishable from the old one, or not actually unlinkable to the old one. And also this uh, auxiliary information can be re-randomized. That, that's not a problem. And then we also have a um, recipient address, but even, even that can be made discardable. Um, and there are several ways to do it. You could use staff addresses, you could use BIP32, uh, or in, in a very naive way, the recipient could just send you like 100 new output addresses. That's also OK. Um, you just need some way to have a uh, large supply of, of uh, addresses of the recipient. So, okay, so everything is discardable and this, and this works out. And um, I think that uh, this is a solution, or this is basically coin join as it should be, because we, we don't have any problems with change addresses. Um, we, we don't need two transactions to spend, so you can mix your money while you're spending it. So basically, you, don't need additional transactions. Um, you don't have this this foot can that we see when you when you're spending your change. It just goes away. 
and you don't need to have the same amounts. And this is this is great because uh, it's much easier to find mixing participants, right? If if you if you go uh, to some ISC channel and, and say, okay, let's do a, a coin mix with uh, sorry a coin join with uh, 1.0578 uh, Bitcoin. I don't know how many people will or how many people will, will respond to that. And this is also a problem that just entirely goes away. Um, so it, it turns out that uh, value privacy, so hiding the values and, and getting un unlinkability actually is a, is a great synergy. They help each other. And we should have both because uh, then we get my, uh, much, much stronger privacy properties. And if, if we have such a solution, then actually privacy pays off because if, if everybody uh, does coin join transactions, then those are smaller than the set of the individual transactions. So um, actually, it, and, and this really takes off if, if you also have signature aggregation, right? Let, let's assume we have 50 users uh, making individual transactions. They all need a, a signature. Now we, we can also do those 50 transactions in a, in a coin join with improved privacy, and we just need one signature if they run a, a signature aggregation protocol, for example, uh, Pilar 11. Um, this actually means that uh, yeah, you save even space in the blockchain so um, by making it more private. So it's a win-win situation, and we save verification time, and the users save fees in the end. Of course, uh, the transaction will take a little bit longer, right? Because they have to find uh, mixing participants, they have to have to do the, the the dice mix protocol and so on. But if they have a little bit of time, and anyway, I mean, transactions take time, you know, um, then users will actually save fees if they use such a solution, and so they have a big incentive to to um, go for a, yeah a default privacy solution actually. So that's great. Uh, Bob wants to mix coins and actually save fees. Um, okay, to, to give you a little bit of technical detail, so we have two variants of, of dice mix. There's one variant that was in the original paper. It has four plus two F communication rounds, where F is the number of actively disrupting parties. So we have we have to uh, we had to see that we have to rerun if somebody disrupts the protocol, and this is where this uh, F comes from. Um, the problem with this variant is that it has some heavy computation if the messages are large, and for um, confidential transactions, the messages are pretty large because they contain the range proofs. Um, so this is why I um, I came up with a new variant. It's it's called Dice Mix Lite. Um, it has five plus three F communication rounds, so it needs basically one round more. But still, in the in the best case, if everybody is honest and doesn't want to disrupt the protocol, it's only five. Rounds, so constant number. It doesn't have any heavy computation. It's much simpler. And uh, this is not in, in the paper, but it can be uh, found in this GitHub repo, um, which I created when I uh, did an internship in the summer at Blockstream, and I uh, started to implement this dice mix light protocol. It's it's not yet there, but you can look at the uh, uh, at the code already. It's it's written in nice Rust. So it, it let's say it's written in Rust. I don't know if it's nice, but. <laughs> You can charge on your own, but uh, I try to uh, write production-ready code, so it's not some prototype. It, it should be usable in practice. And uh, yeah, there are a few practical issues if you want to put this in practice. And um, th the first thing uh, that has to be looked into is banning disruptive users. So the, the naive approach is that the server just keeps a ban list of, of disruptive users. But the problem here is that the server has to understand the protocol to tell if somebody misbehaved or not. And this means that, or, yeah, the server basically is, is the bulletin board, right? So when I say server here, I mean the bulletin board. The problem is that, uh, yeah, it's not clear if everybody wants to run a server that understands this protocol. A um, better idea could be just using rate limiting, for example, like, like join market does. So basically, per UTXO, you have a number of tries. And uh, this could be could actually be made then... Uh, yeah, so the idea is that one UTXO, so one public key, gives you a number of tokens, and then uh, you have a ban list on your server for bad words, basically. That's that's very much like your ISC server. So the hope would be to to be able to run this on, on for example, like like a chat server, ISC server. Another issue is, is double spending, not in the, in the sense that you gain money, but the user could, in the end, 
uh, one of the mixing participants could just try to um, try to double spend against the coin join, and um, then the protocol would abort for everybody. So we need to later wait a little bit to make sure that doesn't happen very often. And another issue is uh, the availability of the bulletin board, but I think it, it's solvable because if the bulletin board goes away, you just take a new one. That's okay. And if if you see other issues, just please please talk to me, and uh, I'm sure there are other things that we have to care about. Okay, so this is my last slide. Um, I think value shuffle is is pretty nice because it kind of combines existing privacy technologies. So we have confidential transactions, we have coin join. With all its, its, its features, we have staff addresses, and, and Value Shuffle basically puts, um, puts them together in, in one solution and uh, gives you a nice, gives you nice strong privacy properties. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions there. Um, quick announcement. I know not everyone was here at the beginning. You may not have heard the code of conduct. Please, no photos or video of the audience. We want to respect people's privacy. We understand you want to take photos of the slides and the presentations. Okay, if you're going to post on social media or anything like that, please make sure no photos of the audience. Appreciate everyone adhering to that. Um, we're now going to take a 15-minute break. Um, there is coffee right outside the doors, and when we get back, we're going to be hearing about Fly Client, Block Sci, Graphene, and uh, a network doing up to one gigabyte block sizes.
Uh, yeah, yeah, it's HTML. Oh, yeah. So we're probably set. I think we're fine. Yeah. So, I guess they only have this microphone. Yeah, or the they have that mobile one. We could just the, that one. So do you, do you have a a uh, uh, oh, lapel mic? Ah, perfect. Yeah. I even have the same. Yeah, just, just close it. Because I'm also team viewer, it's it's a little bit of a mess this morning. I didn't have uh, PowerPoint installed, and I just I realized <laughs> now, and I can. Okay. okay. You should be able to just plug it in, right? Yeah. We have a nightmare of a... Do you have the thing here? The it's, it's plugged in. Here. Ah, perfect. That's the question. Yeah. No, it's the problem is that they... Uh, oh, they have two screens? Yeah, it probably works. Should I ask him? Is it good? Or?
yeah, I just, uh, I wish I didn't have the problems I'm having. The просто idiotism. See, that, that's, what, that's what we're like freaking out. Are you a PC? No, I'm a Mac, but uh... uh... New or old? I mean, this thing or...? I'll just go right to HDMI if that's okay. But your Mac has HDMI? Yeah. Output directly? Yeah. No dongle? No dongle. Okay, you should be fine. Because like, th this is the kind of problems we've been having for the last two days. Uh, and I think this is because yeah. he's not... Uh, because his power is not... <laughs> I figured out. <laughs> Uh, Benedict, uh, that's so that's. Send, just, should I just send it to you? Uh, um, can you can you print this to PDF? Yeah. So send. Uh, okay, wait, can we can we just try? Sorry, when. No, I've tried unplugging, replugging, everything. Uh, yeah, have you tried the, this one? Uh, th this machine needs an upgrade in order to work yeah. with this, I believe. We've been oh, having really? this for the last two days. Okay. No, I've, I've been already because uh, this actually doesn't really help. Unplugging the HDMI, uh, it shows up and then it goes away. Shows up and goes away. Okay, but this is like the, the port here. Have you tried this port? Because this port is sometimes a little bit... Uh, uh, no, I, have, I haven't tried this port. So I think maybe now it works. Like, I, I'm almost uh, yeah, sure that... Mi do mirror. Oh. No, no, switch, so switch to settings and do mirror. Yeah, it looks like that there was your port. Uh, hold on, where the hell was it? Okay. Yeah, I think this should now work. Close the browser and such. For that not to... Yeah. <laughs> for your private stuff not to... Yeah, I'll just uh, get uh, out. What the, what the hell is that? Autoplay? Uh, let, let me just double check. Yeah. It's the hardest thing in the world to. Uh, but the hardest thing in the world is getting games from there on yeah. there. Every it's time. it's amazing that like after like you know how Dec many years like decades, like. decades right we we still haven't figured it out and it's like it does not get easier. I feel like it gets more difficult. Like I know. You think scaling Pikmin is hard? No, I'm getting a image onto the projector. No? No signal. Uh, I'll, I'll export it to PDF. I mean, Hold on. It says it's working, right? What the hell is this? I'll just... I'll just send it to you for PDF. Oh. Like, uh, like yeah, let me just export should, it. You should uh, send me <laughs> PDF. Yeah. Um, it's it's always the hardest thing in the world is getting the image from the computer. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, it doesn't, that's, uh, it doesn't work. Doesn't work okay. um, do you have an adapter to go to VGA? Uh, no, uh, I only have uh, this. Uh, it for some reason is showing in TSC sort of. Just the question is, is uh, my, my biggest fear is, is to break this setup right now. Uh, should we be uh, seeing what's on the... Uh, like the, the yeah, should be seeing right now. I mean, I have a different, I have a different... Uh, why am I showing uh, a refresh rate in terms of... Hurts. It's because it's HDMI. It's a video refresh. Uh, yeah, 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 but.
Okay, now. Okay, uh, set up Benedict. Yeah, so That's I send you my slides. Uh, I check your email, check and I'm meanwhile going to transfer the. You're on PowerPoint too, you said? I think it's just downloading, I guess it's kind of slow. Yeah. So I have this, um, you can highlight. Oh, wow. okay. So basically the clicker, forward, backward, and highlight. Ah, okay. Oh. I kind of want to confirm that works on this screen though, before yeah, we... Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the non-sentence. Oh well, I can try that one. Too. Is it a big file? Four and a half megabytes, so it's not gigantic. I was looking forward to your presentation, so you're like a super light client, eh? Yeah. Is it based on SPV or? Uh, so it's, it's basically, we, we were saying like we're, we're trying to improve SPV. Oh, oh cool. Right. Nice. In SPV, you need to download all the block headers, mm -hmm. right, like the whole, all of the block headers. Yeah. And basically we show that you don't actually need to do that. So what you, you can download only like a logarithmic number. Oh, oh. Maybe it's because Anton's sending a bunch of things over team viewers. No, no, no. Is it working? I thought it was going to be working. Oh, well, no. Yeah, I know. Is it loading? Oh, yeah. It's loading. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, this is painful. Uh, it's always like this before I talk. You gotta take matters into your own hand and. Yeah, I'll find you. I'll, I'll, I'll do it myself. Already, like, can I copy this to the desktop so I don't lose it? Okay, yes, we're, ready, we're ready to go. We're ready, yeah. Okay, we are about to start. Please take your seats. Okay, welcome back. Um, so, sorry, we're running a little bit behind. We're gonna 
uh, we've got a long lunch, so hopefully we can make up some of that for the afternoon. Um, this next talk is Benedict Boons from Stanford University. He's going to be introducing Fly Client, a novel protocol which allows SPV clients on public blockchains to efficiently and securely verify any transaction with only a constant storage requirement. Okay, yeah, thank you. Does, yeah, hey, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be. Okay, hello. I'll talk about Flykind today, which is a super light client for cryptocurrencies. And this is joint work with Loy from NUS and Marty from Visa Research, and Loy and I were at Visa Research for this work. So um, let's recall the blockchain format really quick, uh, quickly. So as you know, the blockchain headers, they, it's a chain because each block header connects to the, or each block connects to the previous block. And this is done through these block, uh, through these hash pointers. And the other thing that is in the, in the header of the, uh, each block is a commitment to all the transactions. So it's using this so-called Merkle tree, a hash tree, where um, in, at each level the, the, the parent node hashes the two children, and this gives you some nice efficient properties, which I'll talk about later. But um, the, so to check that a blockchain is, is correct or internally consistent, I need to check a couple of things. So, so the first thing that I need to check is that all the transactions are valid so that they don't spend more than they have. Then I also need to check that the Merkle tree was constructed correctly. And then finally, um, the one important check is that the, the block headers are correct. And that not only means that they all link to each other, but also that this proof of work requirement is, is Correct. So what is this proof of work requirement? The proof of work requirement is that the block hashes to a number that starts with a lot of zeros. So right now that's over 70 zeros. And the way that this is done is that the miners can choose a nonce, right? They can choose it freely and they try a bunch of nonces um, to find one such that the hash comes out to, with a lot of zeros. So um, now I can check what is that my blockchain that I received from someone that I downloaded is correct. But the problem is now, what if I have two people telling me that, hey, there are two different blockchains, um, which one, how would I know which one is the correct one? So what is Alice gonna do in this case? Well, she can use the so-called longest chain rule. So she looks at the blockchain which has more, which has more blocks in it or, or equivalently more proof of work put into it uh, and that one is the correct chain, or we assume that that one is the correct chain. And kind of the intuition behind it is that it, it was harder to produce, right? It costs more money and costs more real resources, energy, to produce this longer chain. And um, it's kind of summarized in this proof of work conjecture, which says that, that honest mining is an, an equilibrium, and in the equilibrium, the, the dominant strategy is to actually follow the rules of the network. And it, the other part of the, the conjecture is that the majority of the nodes are rational, right? So that a majority of the nodes will actually play this equilibrium and will mine honestly. And this has some really nice property if this holds, because it implies that the longest chain in network will actually be honest, right? It will follow all the rules of the network, um, and it also has this, this nice sleeping beauty property, which means that you can always distinguish an honest and offline chain and a non-honest chain after having been offline. So when you wake up, you just you download all the chains that people will give you, and you will find the one that you can check whether they're consistent, but then you can also find the, the honest one by just checking which one is the longest one. And if this if this proof of work conjecture holds, then uh, you will know that this is actually the, 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 uh, the honest chain that was created following the rules of the network. So this, for example, this property does not necessarily hold for proof of stake. But let's, that's a topic for a different talk. Um, so um, let's switch gears a little bit and, and look at the, so right, like now everything is perfect, I can just download the blockchain uh, on my mobile client after I've been offline. Um, but well, so there's a big problem and I guess that's part of the reason why we're here. The problem is that the blockchain grows and grows and grows and is now roughly 150 gigabytes. And if I have a mobile client, then well, how am I gonna store or verify 150 gigabytes of data? That seems completely infeasible, right? 
So uh, even Satoshi, back when he wrote the white paper, was aware of this issue. So he um, came up with this idea of a simple payment verifying client, or an SPV client. And what does the SPV client do? Well, it just throws away all the transactions, and it just stores the block headers. Um, and the nice thing is that it can still verify all the block headers, and especially it can verify the proof of work. So it still right, can check whether all the transactions or wh which chain is the longest and which chain has the most uh, proof of work put into it. And if this proof of work conjecture holds, then it will actually be able to, to download the best chain, assuming he talks to at least one honest node that gives him the, the best chain. So the SPV client doesn't have all the transactions, so obviously it can't verify all the transactions, but that's okay because, right, we assumed that the longest chain is honest, so the, all the transactions are going to be correct and there's not gonna be double spends because we assume that the longest chain is okay. So um, the SPV client can also verify specific transactions with some help, right? So if I want to tell you this transaction was included at block K, then uh, I can give you a so-called Merkle proof, right? A small inclusion proof that this transaction was in, in, in the block, right? And I can't tell you that some other transaction was in the block if it um, wasn't actually in the block. I see some of the fonts are unfortunately a little bit messed up, but either way, so um, the SPV clients have, have several properties and, and some problems. Uh, the nice thing about them is that they do not grow with the number of transactions, but there's one problem. They still grow with the number of blocks, right? I need to download all the block headers. And for Bitcoin, this isn't really a problem right now because uh, each block header is just 80 bytes and there's not that many blocks because they only produce every 10 minutes. But in Ethereum, for example, the SPV client is 2.2 gigabytes, so really, really large already, and that this is already prohibitive for some mobile phones. And this is especially bad, right, like if you want to have multi-chain clients or clients that work on side chains, right, that want to download many chains, they need to store the block headers for all these different chains. So they uh, grow really expensive and they're not really light anymore. So what can we do? What, what can we build a light client that is sublinear, so that doesn't need to download all the block headers? Well, so luckily there's some, there's some generic pr solutions you could use a snark, but that it um, has several problems, mostly that it's completely impractical. Um, but the, there's other more, more specific solutions, and most importantly, there's these NEPO PALs, so non-interactive proofs of proof of work. Uh, they were developed by Kiresis in 2017, and they're kind of based on this idea that has been has been around uh, for a while, and the, the, the key insight is that a proof of work, right, says, tells you that if I have a hash of X, right, that, that starts with a bunch of zeros, say 70 zeros, to find one of them, on average, I will find two hashes that have 69 zeros, and I will find, like, bit zeros, I will find four hashes that will have 68 zeros, and so on and so forth, right? So, if I have a specific proof of work target, say like 66 uh, or 70 zeros, then the best proof of work or the best quality proof of work that is ever found in the chain is a really good indicator for how much work is in the chain in general. And um, this, this beautiful idea is, is, is used in Nipa Pals. And um, you can use a skip list kind of to, to point to high quality proof of works and then you get proofs, you get a blockchain that, uh, or you get a light client that is rather small. So it, it's actually really small. It's, it's like log n times log log n. And so there's kind of a problem though with these Nepo pals and there's a bribery attack. So these high quality blocks, they're really important for Nepo pals, right? For showing that this is a high value chain, but they don't give you an extra reward. You just get the normal like 12 and a half Bitcoin for including them in the chain. So um, what if I can bribe a rational miner, I'll tell him on the main chain, hey, don't include these really, really high valued blocks, right? I'll pay you twice the block rewards if you don't include them. Um, just throw them away, right? I'll, I'll give you the money. Uh, the problem is then that the, the main chain looks worse and I can easily fake a chain 
that uh, looks better than the main chain, even if I don't have as much mining power as the main chain, because I, I bribed the miners to make the chain look worse, and it wasn't that expensive. So uh, it doesn't violate the NEPA power security proof, because uh, there the assumption is that the main chain is honest, but what if the main chain, right, like what if the miners on the main chain aren't just honest, but they're rational, right? They're, they're, they're willing to be bribed. Then this is an attack. So this motivates the search for a different kind of Nipah uh, using a different approach, so not these high quality blocks. So um, one of the main tools that we're gonna be using is these Merkle mountain ranges, or these Merkle trees. Um, I'll go over them quickly. It's basically just a Merkle tree, this is an idea from Peter Todd, that you can uh, build on, right? So you can extend it, you can append nodes to it, and, and it keeps growing and keeps growing. Um, one of the nice properties is that if I have access to this root, I can very easily check that, that this tree is a subtree of this tree, or I can check here that this tree is a subtree of this tree. Just having these two roots, I just need, like, there's a logarithmic size proof that, that their one tree was based on the, was built on the other tree. So now fly client, how does fly client work? Well, so as you recall, right, every uh, blockchain has this, this previous hash and the block header has the previous hash. Well, what if we don't include just a link to the previous block, but what if we include a root of a Merkle tree and the Merkle tree commits to all the nodes? So then in every block header, I basically have a reference to all the nodes in the whole blockchain. And I can easily do lookups to say, um, was block number 13 included in block number a million? Yeah, there's a very easy logarithmic size proof, so say like 20 element proof, 20 hashes proof, that block uh, number 10 is, is uh, was included in the same chain as, as this head of the chain. So, you, and then the nice thing is that the client just needs to store the head of the chain, right? It just needs to store the head of the chain, and, and if I want to prove to you that uh, a transaction was included, I give you a Merkle proof that the, the block was part of the chain, and then I give you another small Merkle proof that the transaction was part of the block. Um, so, well, now the, the big problem obviously is what if I now get to heads of chains, how do I know which one is the correct one, uh, right? I don't have all the block headers anymore, I can't verify the proof of work, so how would I know which one is the correct one? Well, we have the assumption that, that at least one of the two chains is honest, right? And let's also assume that the other chain is significantly worse, so it has significantly less mining power put in. Say it has like a third of the mining power put in, to, of the real chain, right? Um, so the, what we can do, well, this, this, the straw man one is just ask the, oh, a block went missing there, but ask for, like just sample some random blocks. Just, you know, give me like K different blocks. Oh, oh okay. Um, so the, ah, yeah, well, okay. So we're gonna ask for K different blocks somewhere here in the chain and then uh, and get a Merkle inclusion proof of them. And well, what do we know? Well, we know that, right, like say the chains claim to have the same length. We know that the malicious chain has to have a lot of holes in it, right? It cannot be as long as, as the honest chain because it has by assumption less mining power. In the same time that it took to create the honest chain, the malicious chain would just not have the time to create a long chain, so there are all these holes in it, right? Only one third of the blocks are actually valid. So if we sample uh, just a couple blocks, we actually have a really, really high probability of catching the, um, sorry for the, the, something went wrong with the fonts, but we have a really high probability of, of catching a malicious, um, a malicious chain, right? We only need to sample 81 blocks to get a probability of two to the minus 128. And the, cra the cool thing here right, is that 81 is independent of the chain of the length. No matter how long the chain is, I need to sample 81 blocks uh, to, to be convinced which one is the honest chain. Well, so why is this a straw man? Uh, let's light it on fire. Well, the problem is that, that the, uh, what happens if 
the malicious fork, malicious chain is actually a fork of the main chain. So for most of the chain, it follows the honest chain, and then at the end, it, it, it forks off, just a couple blocks. Well, then we know that in this fork, there's only still the same property holds, right? Only a third of these blocks can be, can be actually there, but the problem is that we might still not catch them because most of our samples would be here and then maybe the, the prover gets lucky on the, on the few samples that we have here. Um, so, but uh, what is important is that if we knew where it forked off, then that would be sufficient, right? Because then we would just sample in this area and uh, then again, we only have to sample a constant number of blocks here, so that suffices to, to check uh, whether the chain is honest or whether it's a malicious fork. So, well, how can we find the, the uh, fork point? Um, let's have our straw man too. Well, the, the two provers um, here could, and, and, and the verifier could use an interactive binary search. So they first look at the first and last block, then at the middle block to find the fork point, right? This takes logarithmic number of, of interactions and then they could find the, and, and every time you use these, these Merkle proofs obviously to check that this is actually a block from this chain, right? Uh, but if we then know this, this um, fork point, then uh, we can very easily do, right, like we then just check a, a constant number of blocks afterward. So this works, the only problem is that it, it requires the two provers to interact and the verifier to interact as well. And we really don't want that, right? That, that why would a prover be uh, willing to do that? That, that just uh, seems cumbersome and um, yeah, is it, it's just not very nice. So let's try to go for something that can be non-interactive. But uh, we can use a similar idea where we just have to bound the forking point. So what if we can just say, hey, I don't know exactly where the forking point is, but I know it's after some value, okay? So I know that like the, the fork must have happened after a certain number of blocks, right? It's, it's in the last 10 blocks or in the last half million blocks. Well, so what can we do here? And here comes the key insight. Um, the key insight is that we can sample enough blocks such that um, at least, say, two-thirds of them would have to be created honestly to pass the check. So, but if the miner only has one-third of the, uh, the if, he, if we know that in the honest chain the miner can only create one-third one of the blocks, then this gives us a bound on, the, on, on where the fork must have happened, right? You can calculate the, the min fork point um, by saying, okay, if he passes this two-third check, then, well, either it's an honest chain, but if it's a malicious chain, then the fork must have happened somewhere after the halfway point. And, well, the step three is just rinse and repeat, right? So we then do this again to get three-fourths, seven-eighths, and so on. And then finally, we just check a couple of blocks at the end uh, to, create, to prevent these, these short forks. So you just check the last uh, 10 or 20 blocks to, um, such, that you, you, um, such that the malicious prover doesn't get, have the chance of being just lucky. So, um, so this is uh, the, the key idea. Uh, well, so, so how good is this, right? So in each interval, we have to check a constant number of blocks, right? The, the number of blocks in each interval doesn't depend on how wide the interval is. In the first, the first interval was the whole chain, then it was like half of the chain, doesn't matter. We always check 81 blocks. Um, then the, the number of blocks that we check is, is just dependent on, on how strong we assume the attacker to be. We have to check log n intervals. Uh, and then for each block, we have to do log and like these Merkle inclusion proofs, which are also logarithmic in the number of blocks. N is the number of blocks. So overall, this gives us a complexity of log n squared. Um, so what does this mean? Well, for, for Ethereum, right, where we said the previously the SPV client was 2.2 gigabytes, now to sync up, right, you only need to store a constant number of blocks after all, but to sync up, I only need to download three megabytes. And then I could throw away even these three megabytes. Um, so this is really cool, but there's one problem, right? This is still interactive, right? 
but right, the, 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 the verifier has to ask for a certain number of blocks. Well, there's a solution for that as well. The verifier, if you, if you remember the protocol, he just requests random blocks, right? There's no, um, there's no specific mandate, so just, he just says, like, give me some random blocks. And um, these, these public coin protocols, and I'll actually talk about this a little bit more this afternoon, um, you can very easily turn them into a non-interactive protocol by just using a hash function to get the randomness. And actually in this specific case, we could get the randomness from the block header. So you just use a hash function, a slightly different one than the proof of work. Say, say you use SHA-3 instead of SHA-256 um, to hash the block and you, you get some random bits from that. Um, and there's a paper on, on how exactly to do this. And this is uh, good enough to, to request just random blocks. And it actually turns out that because creating multiple heads is difficult, you don't even need this two to the uh, minus 128. So you don't even need as much soundness as you would normally need in these cryptographic protocols um, because creating these new heads is, is actually quite difficult. But the cool thing is, right, that now, as a, because it's non-interactive, as a prover, I can just create an SPV proof for one block height once, and then just send it around. And I, like some other people can forward it, there's no interaction anymore. It, it's just, you know, right, like you have your mobile client, you, you turn it on, you have some nice server that gives you an, uh, the, the, the head of the chain along with an SPV proof, and then uh, you have multiple ch servers, of course, right? You want to be sure that you get the same one and at least one of them is honest. That's always the assumption. Um, and then you can just check which one is, is correct and it's going to be very hard for a malicious prover to fool you. So, um, yeah, here's some references. I think the slides will be uploaded. And uh, thank you very much. Anyone with questions, please come up to the mic. Nice talk. So my question was uh, regarding when we talk about that a particular transaction is present in SVP, uh, it can be proven with a proof in the Merkle trees or in all these scenarios. But let's say uh, somebody claims that the transaction is not present uh, with non-inclusion non proofs. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but generally you still rely on asking multiple servers and then verifying that indeed everybody is wrong, right, right? So any thoughts in that direction? Because similar thing will also come in picture here, right? Yeah, so, so, so non-inclusion proofs are very difficult, right? Uh, oh, okay, this is a failed. Well, I, I have a slide on this, but uh, so non-inclusion proofs in SPV clients are very difficult. Um, there's some ideas with bloom filters, but um, in general, uh, not possible, right? Because you, you, should, you would have to check every, every block, right? For even if you have a normal SPV client, it's not really possible. So uh, the question, the challenging question is if you are going to rely on the any trust assumption for that, mm -hmm. uh, then the question we should ask, can we rely on a similar thing for also inclusion case rather than going for cryptographic solution, right? Sorry, what do you mean? So what I mean by that is whether somebody want to prove, uh, provide a proof that mm -hmm. the transaction is present. In that case, we don't rely on asking for multiple of them. But maybe mm -hmm. if you are anyhow going to rely on the multiple servers yeah. to non-inclusion, then make, can we also use them for inclusion? Uh, yeah, you could, but I don't think you have to, right? Because we have nice cryptographic solutions. To, for inclusion proofs, so <laughs> I guess, yeah. Uh, all right, well maybe you covered this, but um, what if someone tried to like attack a specific SPV like node by continuously forking? Like there's another, bl another real block found and then there's another fork trying to go after it. I don't know if that makes sense, but like a continuous like fork to try to get the next block to be, uh, to be a malicious one uh, for that SPV client and then after that, the real box found, so you just so, like write a script to I continue mean, the, 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 the same things hold for a normal Bitcoin client is that you shouldn't trust uh, nodes, transactions that haven't been validated, that aren't deep in the blockchain, right? Because you can always do like a couple blocks of fork, right? You can always do like your, your three block 
forks if you have some sort of mining power, but it's going to be a lot harder to do a fork that is 10 blocks deep or something. And, and, and the same thing holds here, and, and actually in, in, in the protocol, we, you manually check the last constant number of blocks, right, to, to kind of prevent that as well. But uh, here, check the final L blocks. Um, but yeah, so that's, that attack is certainly possible, but that's why you can't trust transactions that are only a few blocks deep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so our next presentation, we've got Harry Kolodner from Princeton University uh, talking about BlockSci, an open source tool that enables fast and expressive analyses of Bitcoin's blockchain and many other blockchains. Wi-Fi problems here. Just give it a second. It's it's going to take like yeah. uh, a minute to run. I think we should just uh, just one about just it's loading. Okay, while we're doing the AV thing, does anybody have one more question for Benedict while we've got where's, a little extra time? Where's the Wi-Fi here? Yeah, I, uh, w w wherever he is. Um, yeah, I was wondering how that would affect uh, bandwidth because a lot of times SPV wallets are, you know, cell phones and they might not have good connections. And I was wondering if they were doing all this fraud proofs uh, or trying to figure out where the where the forking block was, uh, how how that would work on like 2G, 3G bad reception cell phone, if if yeah. Ben, are you, st are you still here? Okay, sorry that went out into the ether. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so next time we're gonna do scaling Wi-Fi. Yeah. yeah. Scaling Wi-Fi, scaling HDMI. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just one more minute. No, we have. Right, it's, you, there's just multiple things. Okay, so while we're doing that, um, any previous speakers, any previous speakers still in the room? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay. So we've got any questions for uh, Pedro from the, the first presentation today? We've got a little extra time now, so let's uh, take advantage of that. <laughs> Anyone know that was uh, refreshing memories? That uh, presentation was concurrency and privacy with payment channel networks. Any residual questions from there? Okay, great. That, that was the last presentation before the break, right? Oh. No, my, uh, who, right there. All right. Um, so how do you combine what you said 
uh, with the previous speaker that said that lightning channels aren't um, all that private. Um, can something like that be implemented at the start of the lightning channel to give us more yeah. privacy? Like how do you combine your presentation with the previous one? So it sounds like an interesting idea, but I have, yeah, I have no idea. I have to think about this. Um, but yeah, we, we, sh we should talk about it maybe. Yeah. All right. Uh, other questions? Okay. Um, anybody have any special talents? They want? Okay, great. <laughs> I have a general question. Is there like a IRC channel for the scaling? Is there a Telegram group? Yeah, it's, on the, group? it's on the website uh, at the top. Yeah. So website. Uh, and again, uh, reminder, yeah, thank you to could, those could, who uh, got contacted on Twitter with audience uh, photos. Should, Thanks for taking those down. Start. Really appreciate you uh, because, helping to uh, yeah, keep with the rules. Um, but that, that won't solve the problem, though. Uh, it's the Google, Google Slides refuses to load through multiple hotspots, and uh, local Wi-Fi just cut out periodically. Uh, yeah, 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 that's uh, that's what we're gonna do right now. Just yeah. uh, try, try. Uh, uh, go ahead, and try. Because I'm I'm connecting already. Try two hotspots. Yeah. Oh, we got we got a hotspot here. Oh, look at this. Multiple hotspots. Okay. Okay. Let's try this. Hold on. So this is uh, SSID. See that? Okay. It does make life easier. <laughs> okay, so any other speakers? We are going to try to fix this issue over lunch. If you have not yet done so, please create a PDF of your presentation okay. um, and uh, send it to Anton and Worst case scenario, we will just load up a PDF on a laptop and can keep things moving. Yeah, yeah, you got. It. All right. Uh, yeah, this yeah, thing is working. There's one other. Uh, it's, it's, it it's, work, it no, but by, by the time you get to this page, it yeah. will load. <laughs> it's 67%. It's like waiting for your transaction to confirm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what's. <laughs> Come on. Looking up fonts.googleapis.com. And we're, we're all tech people here. We, we, we know what this is like. <laughs> yeah, this, the schedule is probabilistic, not, not deterministic. Well, that's exactly it, yeah. I just went in presentation mode and it's reloading the Google Slides. God Almighty. Uh, did this cease to function or? <laughs> oh no, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, went on this page. Do you want to do yeah. USB tethering? Um, uh, no, hold on. Okay. Yeah, should be. Don't don't touch. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's still some slides loading, but <laughs> we might hit mid presentation and have it. Okay, uh, Brian Levine, are you are you here? Do you, are you ready to go by any chance? Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna. Is it? 
Are you loaded? They're loaded? Okay. Okay, we're going to shuffle up the order here. Um, so now we're going to uh, welcome up uh, Brian Levy Levine from the College of Information and Computer Sciences at UMass Amherst. Um, he's going to be presenting a proposal for Graphene, an efficient method of announcing new blocks. Um, and he's going to go into, this has been published previously, but uh, we're going to be seeing a little bit more detail than has been shared in prior presentations or publications. Hold on, hold on a second. I really should have waited for the presentation to load before saying that. We're all learning the hard way, no zero confirmation presentation announcements. Are you kidding me? Um, does it have HDMI output? Does it have HDMI output? Okay, you can plug in HDMI. A good sign, right? All right, take it away, Brian. Okay, so uh, I'm Brian Levine. This is joint work uh, with uh, some people I work with at UMass, uh, Panar, uh, George, and Amir, and also Gavin Andreessen. Sorry, I'm just adjusting the screen. Okay. So uh, the problem I'm going to focus on in this presentation is how to relay information to a neighbor about a new block that you know about and they don't know about next. They don't know about yet. So that would be on the fast relay network or just in the regular peer-to-peer -peer network. And it's about avoiding the following situation um, where you're sending, this is like the really naive solution is just to send the full block. That would be crazy, right? So Alice, who has the block, sa says to Bob, who wants the block, has a mempool. And she says, hey, here's an in for a new block. And Bob says, oh, I don't know about that one yet. Why don't you send it to me? And then there's this, uh, sorry, the slides are a little screwed up, but I think it'll be okay. Uh, she says, okay, well, here's the block header, and here's the full set of transactions that are there. That's crazy. There's no, really no need to do that. Um, okay. Oh, that's funny. Up there, it's animated. Down here, it's not. I got it. Okay. So... Um, so the reason we want to do this is that uh, block announcements are faster when they're smaller, right? We, there may be certain firewalls we want to get through, and that's easier with very few packets. When blocks propagate faster, there's less orphaning in the network, less forking, and that means mining is efficient. And when mining is efficient, there's a better return on the investment. And when there's a better return on the investment, maybe there's even more mining, and you know, blockchains are more secure when there's a higher hash rate and so on. So let's look at how we can reduce the amount of network that goes, uh, the amount of data that goes between Alice and Bob. And I want to clarify, this isn't a presentation about reducing the size of the blockchain itself. It's just about Alice and Bob informing each other about new information. So let me tell you the result ahead of time so that you stay interested. So the protocol I'm going to describe to you that does this, Graphene, is about a tenth the size of the current methods. And by that, I really mean compact blocks. There's no increase in round trip time compared to it. There's not a significant use of storage or CPU to do this. And the reason we're able to get these gains is we're combining in a nifty or cute way two known solutions from the set reconciliation literature, Bloom filters and IBLTs. Probably no Bloom filters already. It's part of Bitcoin. Maybe you've heard of IBLTs. I'll give you a very high, over, uh, high level overview of each. So why does this work intuitively? It's because we're optimizing the very special case that Bitcoin prevents to us, which is Everyone needs to know everything all the time. There's nothing that's not of interest. And blocks are comprised of transactions that everyone's probably heard about already. So that's what set reconciliation is. It's not that I have a lot of information and I want to get it to you. It's that I've got information and you've got the same information and there's some subset of it that we both want to agree upon. Okay? So that's what we want to exchange, the subset, the, the delineation, not the information itself. 
So the best way, I think, to describe to you graphene is to actually build it up from a series of other protocols. So we're gonna start with compact blocks, then we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about extreme thin blocks, I'm gonna make up a protocol which I'm just gonna name soot, um, and then we'll do IBLTs, and then finally we'll get to graphene. And so each time I'm gonna change some aspect of the protocol to make it more efficient. This is kind of the Jim Carosa, you know, method of introducing protocols if you know the networking book. So here's protocol one, uh, compact blocks, which you probably know from BIP 152. And so, you know, there's this enormous savings in compact blocks that you can't get again. I mean, the reduction is fantastic. And the basic idea is that why would you send the full transactions, right? You can just send the, the transaction IDs. And in fact, you don't even need to send all 32 bytes of those transaction IDs. You can get away with, say, five or six bytes because the chances of making a mistake are like one in a trillion, it's insane. And if you made that mistake, it would be easy to recover instantly on the network, and plus, they'll never happen. So uh, if you do this, you go from, say, a one megabyte block, by which I mean, say, it's got something like 4,200 transactions, um, it would be expressible in 21 kilobytes, and an eight megabyte block, if you've got them of that size, is down to about 164 kilobytes. So this is the gold standard that I wanna beat in this talk. In fact, here's a fuller, fuller view of how well compact blocks does. So this is based on a small Python simulation uh, that we wrote, and you can see that it, it grows linearly, meaning the amount of data that compact blocks has to exchange between Alice and Bob um, is very small, but grows linearly with the size of the block. And I'm gonna put up this graph again and again with compact blocks, always the line as a point of reference. And in all the graphs, you can see on the top axis, I'm really doing this in terms of transactions, and then I just make a simple assumption that the size of the block is that many transactions times, I think, 250 bytes I used. So that's how I'm getting block size on the bottom there, okay? All right, so can we do better? Yes, we can, we can do, uh, we can make use of bloom filters. And as I said before, the reason bloom filters will work here really well is because our neighbors already have these transactions. They're probably only missing a few. And we have a couple options here. Alice can use bloom filters based on the block she's holding or her mempool, and Bob could use bloom filters based on the, the mempool that he's holding, all this kind of stuff. So in case you don't know, what's a bloom filter? It allows you to check whether some item is part of a set that's already been put together. So. If you don't know Bloom Filters, that's just an amazingly cute, fantastic data structure that you should know. So here's a, here's a high level overview of it. Uh, what we're gonna do is create a bit array. And so in my example here, I've got a bit array of seven entries. And so I'm gonna insert an element into this bit array, into the Bloom Filter, and let's say I've got transaction one. What I'll do is I'll hash it with a couple, maybe a few, this is how many is in the weeds that I wanna get into now. But let's just say there's two hash functions that we'll send it through. So I'll send it through transaction one, sorry, uh, hash value one, and it tells me, what I really should say is I send it through that hash function and then I XOR it with the size of the array. So it tells me, okay, that's index one. And what I do is set that bit. And then I send it through the other hash function, I XOR it and I get index four, and I set that bit. Now I wanna put another element into the set. So I take transaction two, which is part of our block, I send it through hash one, it tells me to set index zero, and then it just so happens to collide with the first, in, the, the first uh, transaction and we set uh, index four again, okay? So there's a little bit of collision there. Okay, now I'd like to send this to Bob and Bob's gonna check whether a certain transaction in his mempool is actually in this block by checking against the hash, checking against the Bloom filter. So what he does is he takes that first transaction, he sends it through the same hash functions, this is sort of a known thing, you don't have to exchange each time, and then he arrives at the same, uh, the same values, he checks cell one and cell four, and it appears that yes, transaction one is in this set. Similarly, he might take some transaction three that was never put in the Bloom filter, send it through those hash functions, and he gets cell one and cell five and sees that since cell five is zero, there's no way that transaction three could have ever been in this Bloom filter. So that's a true negative. And then we might get a false positive though. That's really the problem with Bloom filters. Here we have some transaction four. It happens to collide with two cells that we've already set to one, cells zero and one, and we get a false positive that this appears to be there. By the way, if you think about it, false negatives are not possible, so that's left as an exercise to the reader, okay? So the deal is that if you don't want these false positives, what you have to do is make the array larger. So Bloom filters represent this trade-off. If you have a low false positive rate, or if you need a lower false positive rate, you have to make the Bloom filter 
larger, right? And our whole goal in this talk is to send as little, as few bytes as possible over the network. So let's see how you would use this. So Extreme Thin Blocks is an example previous work that made use of Bloom filters. And what we're trying to do is, um, we're gonna, Alice is gonna, is gonna say, hey, I've got a new block. Bob's gonna say, okay, I want that new block. And by the way, here's a Bloom filter of everything in my mempool. Go ahead and send me anything you think I don't have that might be in the block. And Alice will do that and then send all the transaction IDs itself. So I'm gonna kind of put this aside because it's actually more, more data than compact blocks itself. And there's another way to solve the problem. Um, what you can do to solve the problem is assume that, in fact, Alice will prioritize sending transactions that appear to be in the block. And what I mean by send the transaction is, Alice will say to Bob, here's an inv that we've never spoken about before, but is in the next block. And to be clear, Bob does not need to request the transaction. He just says, great, there's an inv there, okay? So let's assume that that's happened. We don't need Bloom filters from Bob anymore. So Alice says, here's an inv for a block. Bob says, I would like that, and the size of my M pool is M, okay? So Alice says, well, that's great. Let me make a Bloom filter of all the transactions that are in this block, and I'll set the false positive rate of that Bloom filter to be one over M. So for instance, if there's a thousand transactions in the mempool, the false positive rate would be one over a thousand, okay? So how many false positives do we expect to get here? If Bob sends every transaction in his mempool through the Bloom filter, Oh, there's like 400 people here. Someone raised their hand, one, right? They put a one up. Okay, we expect one to happen here. So that's not very good, by the way, right? Because if every time Alice says to Bob, I've got a block for you, and Bob says, here's how many transactions I have, and then Alice says, well, here's a Bloom filter so that you can filter down what's in your mempool, Bob will, we expect, include one transaction that's not in there, and then he'll form the Merkle tree, and he'll have a Merkle root that doesn't match the header that he just received. He can't recreate the block that Alice sent to him. So how would you solve this problem? You lower the false positive rate of the Bloom filter, and you make it much larger. So let's say we do something like the false positive rate is one over 100 times the size of the, of the mempool, of Bob's mempool. And then in that case, we'd only expect this process to fail one out of every 100 times, and when it does, we just fall back to compact blocks, amortize that cost, and we're good, right? Seems like a very efficient protocol. In fact, this protocol, which by the way does not exist, this is the one I'm calling soot, it does pretty well compared to compact blocks. Compact blocks is again that red line, and what is now the case is that how much data soot sends over the network is dependent on the size of the mempool, because that's our parameter for how big the bloom filter is that comes from Alice, because as the false positive rate goes down, the bloom filter size goes up. Okay, so we're doing a bit better here, but can we do better? Oh, and by the way, before I switch, here's a zoom in on the right for one megabyte block, and on the left is sort of the larger blocks, right? But you can see the same relative performance happens, whatever the size of the block is, okay? Percentage-wise. Okay, can we do better? Yes, we can. So, we're gonna leverage uh, known literature, Invertible Bloom Lookup Tables, or IBLTs, and there's a couple really good papers on this that I'll, I'll make use of mechanisms from both of them. IBLTs are not as well known as Bloom filters. They're a bit more complicated, and I'm just gonna tell you what you need to know to understand what I'm gonna say next. There's um, more functionality in Bloom filters than you need for this talk, and um, if you have questions, I can answer them. But the basic idea is really a generalization of the Bloom filter concept. There's a lot of these data structures around set reconciliation data structures that are out there. And at a high level, what's different is instead of a bit, we're actually gonna keep count of the number of elements we've happened to have inserted into each cell. You know, we're, we're gonna take a set, an element that we'd like to insert, hash it, it will arrive at a particular index just like before, but rather than pu putting a one there, setting the bit to one, we're gonna up a count and we're gonna store the content in there as well. I'm just hand-waving here. There's some real details that I'm not gonna go through. So let's say I've got an IBLT of a certain size and I've inserted into it already A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Now, what's nice about IBLTs that you can't do with Bloom filters is that if you have two of them, let's say I have another IBLT right here, uh, and they differ by no more than about 15%, you can actually perform a a subtraction operation on them. It's not the normal subtraction, but it's a subtraction operation. And you get the symmetric difference back. And by get back, I mean you actually get the elements back. Not only that, you learn which element was in which IBLT. So here I have A, B, C, D, F, G, and I have A, B, C, X, 
EFG. And so what the symmetric difference is two, and I get both of those back. And what's great about this is that the size of the IBLT, and this will be counterintuitive to you because I've not given you enough details, the size of the IBLT does not depend on the initial list. It depends only on the symmetric difference that you expect to be able to decode after subtraction. So if I had a million elements or a trillion elements in both of these two lists, their sizes would be the same as, as it, it, you know, it doesn't matter, it only matters that uh, they differ by two elements. So IBLTs can be very small if you can manage that expected difference. Okay, so let's try to apply this in a fourth protocol. We're gonna change things up a little bit again. Okay, and so again, we're prioritizing our transactions that happen to appear in the block if they haven't been sent already, but they likely have. So Alice says, okay, I've got a new block. Bob says, that's great, I don't have that one. Can you send that to me? And Alice says, here's an IBLT of all the transactions that are in the block. And Bob says, thanks very much. And to be clear here, Bob is not sending anything back. Notice I don't have a black arrow, uh, arrow going left here. Bob says, let me create an IBLT of my mempool. I'll do this um, subtraction operation, which is from the Epstein paper I, wrote, I mentioned before. I wrote, I uh, listed on the slide, but didn't mention before. And if it decodes, then we're done. And what I mean by if it decodes, the IBLT has to account for this 15% difference. And if you can't, you have to make the IBLT even bigger. So if your IBLT is not big enough, you have to kind of fail and double it and try again. Um, and so really what's going on here is the size of the IBLT is the amount of data we're gonna send over the network, in other words, is, is based on the difference between the mempool and the block. So mempools are not always small, right? There are times when they grow enormously large. And in that case, this IBLT solution will use just an enormous amount of data. And so here's our trusty old graph again. You can see compact blocks here on the red. And you know, intuitively, things are great when the mempools are small because we don't have much symmetric difference, and that's the lower lines here. But you can see that green line where the mempool is 10,000 transactions larger than the block itself. The IBLT just blows up in size in order to account for that, and this solution sort of falls apart, okay? So can we do better? Yes, we can, okay? So here we are at the last protocol. Now you understand all the problems that we're trying to overcome. The, the problems are basically, if I use bloom filters alone, it's expensive to use bloom filters when the symmetric difference is high. Right, when the mempool is very large. When I use IBLTs, they're also expensive when the difference is high. So, two great tastes that takes great together, right? You use a bloom filter to reduce the symmetric difference between the block and the mempool, and then you solve the problem of letting a couple things go through with the IBLT, okay? So, you don't need, in this case, a very low false positive rate for the bloom filter, because the IBLT cleans up the mess. And because the mess is very small, the IBLT itself is very small. And what's really great about this is because I, uh, bloom filters are probabilistic, although you know the expectation of how many things are gonna fail, you don't know which things will fail, but the IBLT doesn't care. It will recover it anyway. So this all just sort of magically fits together. So, uh, like to give you an example of this, we could set the bloom filter to a false positive rate of one over the size of the mempool, just like before. We expect one false positive, but remember I told you, IBLTs, their size depends not on the size of the block, not on the size of the mempool, just the size of the expected difference. The expected difference is one transaction. That is a teeny tiny IBLT. It's almost nothing. So it turns out that if you read our, our paper, you can parameterize the, the false positive rate of the bloom filter and the IBLT settings together in one equation. And I'm kind of lying here, but I'm, I'm not. Uh, the false positive rate is just and over this denominator. The reality is uh, bloom filters have some ceiling functions in them and it turns out if I wrote the real version it's just too messy for the slide but the work is no different computationally. I'm not hiding some linear, um, some, some complicated computation. It's really just as simple as this. Okay, so here's the protocol. Alice says to Bob, hey, I've got a new block. Bob says, that's great. Here's the size of my mempool. Al says, that's wonderful because I know the, the size of the block. I'm gonna use that little formula from the previous slide. I'm gonna create a bloom filter uh, that's just the right size such that the sum of the size of the bloom filter and the, and the size of the IBLT is at its optimal smallest point and I'm gonna send you both. Bob says, that's wonderful because I'm gonna take that bloom filter, send all my, my mempool transactions through it, I'll get this filtered set, let's call it M prime, and I'll create an IBLT out of M prime, and then I'll decode the difference, I'll subtract I from I prime, 
I is the IBLT that I'll send. And then I'm done. And in fact, if this doesn't work, why don't you send me a larger IBLT to account for some weird probabilistic failure? Well, it turns out that the failures really never happen. It's like one in a thousand. If you tune the IBLTs properly, this, this never happens. In fact, when we evaluate this, and you can see the results here, we use real bloom filters and IBLTs to account for the fact that these things randomly fail. They just never do if you do it right. So wow, we're doing pretty good here. This is a one megabyte block really defined by the fact that it has 4,000 transactions in it. Um, and you can see Compact Blocks was doing something around what? Almost 20K, but the graphene solution is doing really well. The only disadvantage is that the size increases with the size of the mempool, but I've got a mempool up here of 100,000 transactions that are not in the block, and it's really just not growing that fast at all. Um, and if I expand this to larger blocks, uh, you can see that the, the same scaling properties hold. It's really one-tenth throughout. So if the mempools went up beyond that, it really wouldn't grow any faster. Okay, so that's it. So graphene block announcements are about one-tenth the size of current methods, fits in about one IP packet, right? You can see here that compact box would not for these larger size blocks, larger than an IP. Um, there's no increased time, and there's no increased round trip time. It's not a significant use of storage or CPU, combines two known tools in kind of a nifty way. And if you're curious, there's a small write-up I made um, at this little URL, and that's it. I'll take any questions that you have. Everybody understood everything, no questions. Here's one. So obviously you're talking about bigger block size, so you would need a hard fork to have bigger block size. We already have uh, an example, I mean, Bcash has larger block size. So are these results theoretical, or have you been like trying to like spam the Bcash blockchain because they don't have enough transactions to actually test this? Uh, no, this is all uh, Python simulation. Okay, on which chain? Which what? Like uh, Python simulation of what? Do you have like a test net of Bitcoin with bigger blocks, or are no, you testing it on the Bcash test net? Like, uh, like where are you at, or is this all simulation? Or is, are there testnet bitcoins where this has been tested? Okay, so the question was, what, how did I get these results, essentially? So this is a Python simulation of Alice talking to Bob. And so since it's Alice talking to Bob, what's going on with the rest of the network doesn't matter. All I care about is that there are transactions that need to go from Alice to Bob. I do randomly generate transaction IDs, which is the same as sampling, for, same as hashing something, and I do actually create bloom filters and actually create IBLTs and recover the list uh, to each other. I would love someone to code this up and put it on a real network. Um, that would be wonderful. So, but I didn't, I didn't spam any network or, you know, um, hurt anyone. No one got hurt in the making of this presentation. Uh, how does the receiver determine the ordering of transactions in the block? How do I what? How does the, re how does the receiver recover the ordering of transactions, or do you expect them to brute force it? Ah, the order. Okay, so. If you, if you create a block that for some reason has a very specific order for the Merkle tree, then you've created a problem because uh, there's, no, there's no efficient way, in the worst case, that's n log n bits to describe the order of something, right? Now, in the best case, there's a known canonical ordering and you say sort the blocks by their, their hash, and in that case, um, these results are as small as they are. But if you have to create a block that specifically has a non-canonical ordering, then these results would be higher. And so in particular, um, like that green line that's at 20 would go up to, I think, about 80 or 100. Yeah, so we're still, you know, about less than half of compact blocks. Gotcha. But what you're doing is raising the theoretical minimum of what it takes to describe a block to someone. And so if that's worth it to have non to have a very specific ordering per block, then um, what I would say is that graphene is gonna meet the basic, I mean, graphene at that point is doing as best as the theoretical lower bound on describing a block to someone else. Gotcha. So I don't think anybody could do better if you wanna introduce that yeah. requirement because it would overwhelm what we're gotcha. doing. And then, you know, for reference, like blocks do have an ordering because you have to, you have to sort them by dependent, dependent inputs. So, you know, you can't have a transaction that's like spent by another one before the one actually creates the output. So all blocks do have an ordering. Right. So. So as long as there's a canonical ordering, then, then we could do it. But I, but I agree, if there is an ordering that you have to specify, then yeah. you mean, would and, go and up. And just, just based on the TXIDs, you can't determine the ordering. Because we don't, you know, it's not like sorted or anything like that. So, but yeah, you need to transfer that extra data. Yeah, okay. so, so if that's the case, then 
we're done because there's there's no way you can do better than this. Like we would, that that cost would still be half of compact blocks, but it would overwhelm. I mean, you can see graphene. The blue line is basically at zero, so all the cost would be in specifying the ordering, and and block propagation would be about basically specifying ordering. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you said that, but I'm. It's not clear to me why you're trying to find the difference between the mempools instead of just looking for the block. Uh, since blocks are fairly specific in size, uh, wouldn't it be easier to just try to consolidate the top, well, eight megabyte or something of the mempool uh, by economic order? Are you asking if I'm trying to find the difference between Alice and Bob's mempools? It, it seems that you're I'm deriving doing. the IBLT over the whole mempool, which would be very different. But different. I'm not. Okay. Um, um, the mempool is over the. Sorry, the the mempool is over the. Sorry, the IBLT is over just the block from Alice's perspective, and from Bob's perspective, it's just the transactions in his mempool that pass through the Bloom filter which is uh. approximately the block plus or minus some transaction which he doesn't know which it is. The IBLT tells him which transaction it is. Uh, That's why this you. works. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great, thanks a lot. You can find me um, and ask me other questions if you'd like. Okay, we going back to Harry? Okay. I'll try to get this. I'm just sacrificing my main machine. Provided this works. Do you get a signal? Yes. We're good. All right. Many people use Max. Thanks, Harry. Awesome. Okay, all right. right. All righty. <sighs> all right, well, my name is uh, Harry Kalander. I'm a student at Princeton University, and I'm here to tell you about a tool that I built alongside uh, some colleagues of mine at Princeton. Uh, that can be used for analyzing the blockchain in any number of ways. Now, most of the talks, uh, I guess really all the talks you've heard so far today have been about fairly constructive about kind of designing new, modif new ways to, to use the blockchain, new protocols to slightly modify Bitcoin uh, in order to improve scaling. Whereas I'm gonna kind of take a step back and talk about ways that we can kind of assess what sorts of, of scaling demands there are that go beyond, oh, blocks are full, that go more into, why are blocks full? Um, since I think that's kind of an important question to confront. So yeah, why, why we need analytics? Well, we wanna be able to motivate scaling solutions. We don't wanna just kind of, I mean, it, it's very cool to just present an idea and say this would, this would up the throughput in this way uh, but when we do that, we really want to be able to know how that's going to affect actual kind of use cases of Bitcoin. Uh, and, and so kind of using analytics, we can discover new areas for improvement by kind of getting a better understanding of, of what types of transactions people want to put on the blockchain, what types of, of use cases people have in practice. And we can categorize demand for block space in t by different use cases, which then may kind of, then we can look at whether scaling affects kind of some use cases differently than others, and, and it's just kind of important to keep a general view of, of the whole ecosystem, rather than getting completely swamped in the technical details without kind of understanding the circumstances that they occur in. So I'm gonna start out by talking about kind of some, what I find interesting more economic questions we can ask about the blockchain. And these are all use cases for BlockSci. Uh, and I think kind of demonstrate nicely how BlockSci benefit, how BlockSci can, can, can help out when we think about scaling. And then the second part of my talk, I'll go into some more of the details about how BlockSci is built and what exactly BlockSci is. Um, 
So to start, I'm just gonna look into a few different ways of how we can tell the difference between real organic demand for, for Bitcoin and artificial demand. For instance, is our blocks totally full and the mempool is, is overloaded because there are a huge number of people who actually wanna make transactions or is there a spam attack going on? Um, since when you're just counting transactions in the mempool, that all kind of looks the same. Um, so we can do a lot of things. We can kind of differentiate between different types of, of demand for block space. And so if we're looking at kind of how much Bitcoin is moving in a given day, well, the total number is gonna have a lot of noise in it. It's gonna include change addresses, it's gonna include people doing weird things where they send money to themselves, it's gonna be all sorts of things. And so if we, we really wanna be able to differentiate how much Bitcoin is actually being transferred from, from person to person, business to business in a day. And none of the questions I'm presenting can be firmly answered in, in like a very nice way. And so what we're talking about here is at least getting an idea of, of kind of the scope of what's going on. Uh, we can look at how much Bitcoin is being used as a store of value versus a medium of exchange. So are, is, is really everyone in the ecosystem a holder? Is everyone just kind of investing now, which you know, seems like a pretty good idea? Or are people buying coffee? <laughs> and you know, not, not, not necessarily small purchases, but are, are kind of, is there serious uh, exchange of kind of currency for goods going on? Uh, and then, like I said, kind of detect the difference between organic demand coming from a wide base of users versus, I said malicious here, but not necessarily malicious, just uh, any, like, is there one particular business that is, is doing some weird things in, in Bitcoin that's just generating a large amount of transaction load? Since the size of blocks today, it's not that hard to, to overload the network. Uh, so one thing we can look at is the velocity of Bitcoin. Uh, and, and so this idea is just looking at how much Bitcoin is moved in a day. And if we very naively just go through each day and look at all the outputs and add them up, then we get this blue line, which is this very, very spiky graph. And so looking at that, you would think it, there's, there's no rhyme or reason to really what's going on with Bitcoin, that, that it's people are, are sending money in no sort of discernible pattern and, and kind of you can't really learn anything. But we can clean this up a lot and we can kind of try to get a better idea of how much money is actually being moved in Bitcoin. One very, one very important thing to do is, again, to discount self-churn. Now that's change addresses, that sends to self. Um, and to do that, you need to be able to have a fairly good heuristic understanding of the blockchain uh, based on kind of currently whatever state-of-the-art clustering you have. Um, and so what's interesting here is if you look at kind of our, our adjusted line, which is the orange, you could see a, something that makes a lot more sense, which is that Bitcoin has been kind of fairly steadily, steady in its demand and just recently kind of in this year started a gradual rise. And this is what I'd like to think about is actually people sending each other Bitcoin in, in exchange for you know, goods, services, what have you. Um, Another thing you can look at is we can try to see, we can try to get some sort of, of handle on how much of Bitcoin's volume is people going to exchanges and buying Bitcoin and holding on to it. Uh, and so one, one kind of interesting thing we did here is we can correlate between, so our blue line here is the percentage of, of outputs that have moved in the last month. So are, are kind of all the outputs just sitting in place or are people actually spending their UTXOs, sending them around. Um, and we've correlated that with trade volume gotten from uh, data from exchanges. And, and the really cool thing here is that you can see the spikes are extremely correlated. And so any, basically any time there's a lot of Bitcoin being moved around, chances are it's people buying or selling on exchanges. Um, and, one, and, and now kind of starting to turn more into kind of the details of, of how BlockSci helps accomplish these results. Uh, one, one thing that we've implemented on top of BlockSci, which again, I haven't really defined exactly what our system is yet, which I'll do in the second half of the talk, is the ability to kind of implement clustering heuristics. Now, we've, there was mention in earlier talks, I'm not gonna really go into the details here, but there's a lot you can do and all starting off of the work of, uh, of Michael John quite a while ago, to link addresses together 
and try to understand what wallets they that a single user controls multiple addresses. Uh, we can use we can do this by looking at change by looking at whether fresh addresses are used. We can do this looking at shared inputs. There are also a whole number of other kind of more specific uh, methods we can use. Looking at what trying to estimate what fee calculation algorithm was used when setting the fee for a transaction. And so there's a whole lot to do here, and it, there's a lot of choices to make. There's nothing clear, and so having a system where we can try out different combinations of heuristics in order to see what effects they have is a really powerful thing. And, and that kind of compares to all the, kind of most of the current state-of-the-art clustering, which in, in their defense is, is leaps and bounds ahead of kind of what we've actually produced because they have a lot of data sources, whereas we're just looking at the blockchain. Um, but they don't really give you any control over exactly what, sort of, what you want to do. And, and how you want to link together addresses. And so having a tool like BlockSci, which allows you to build on top of it fairly arbitrary heuristics for, for connecting addresses to each other is a really powerful thing. And, and just over uh, the, the graph on this slide is just uh, a look at, at what sort of clusters we found on the blockchain just using the joint, joint input heuristic and the change address heuristic. And it's, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, which, which shows, I think essentially 130 million of addresses weren't really clustered at all, and there was one cluster of about 140 million in a single cluster. And so you can see kind of the naive approach doesn't really work, but I think what's important here is that it makes it very easy to, to explore new directions, and, and kind of the, the real sell for BlockSci in this is that it's capable of clustering the entire Bitcoin blockchain uh, in under 10 minutes. And so you can really rapidly try out different, different options and different combinations, uh, different weights to different heuristics, which might disagree. Uh, and so that's really powerful, I think. So the, a, a blockchain analysis tool, there are a lot of different websites, different tools out there that analyze Bitcoin data in different ways. Uh, but I think all of the ones that I've seen, at least, suffer from, from kind of one of a number of different problems. Uh, there are a lot of closed source uh, services, websites out there that will give you very interesting data about the blockchain that you have absolutely no way of, of validating, of verifying. And you know, from, from kind of someone who, who's a big fan of decentralized systems, it seems really wrong to trust a, a central party about, about analytics uh, when, when kind of we have blockchain data ourselves. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of different tools have limited functionality. They were essentially designed for for kind of some purpose, to calculate some statistic. Uh, and, and, but kind of their, their use stops there. Uh, and, and so kind of making a tool that can really answer any sort of question that you might want to pose, I think is a really powerful thing. Uh, and, and then further, a lot, of tool, a, lot of, uh, a lot of tools just run into the problem of insufficient performance. Um, Anybody who's tried to import the Bitcoin blockchain into any sort of general purpose uh, database uh, knows that it's not fast and it's huge. Uh, and so having a tool that, that really kind of gets around that issue, uh, I, I think uh, hopefully people see the use in. Uh, so yeah, the solution to kind of that, that solves all of those issues is, uh, is BlockSci. And, and I'm just going to throw up here the, the architecture diagram. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about all the parts of BlockSci. Uh, we, have a, we have a paper out there, uh, which kind of is going to end, and also the code is uh, public on GitHub. Uh, but I want to talk about kind of the big picture of, of, of how it's assembled. Uh, there are really mainly two parts of the system. There's the analysis library, which reads data out of our customized uh, database format, which is been designed by hand to be compact and, and also to be uh, highly localized, um, and which uses a fairly protocol independent format so that you can very easily make it work with certainly Bitcoin, but also easily Bitcoin testnet or Litecoin or Namecoin um, or, or any number of, of other blockchains. Um, and on the other side of that, we have the parser, which actually does the work of producing this, this, this data format. Um, and so, and that has the, uh, has the benefit, uh, which some other tools have, but I think has not been done uh, super nicely, of providing incremental updates 
um, when as, as new blocks come in, it can update the database and handle reorgs, which are not very fun to handle, but <laughs> can be done um, in a way that can provide a static view of the blockchain to our analysis library. Um, so just a little kind of shot of, of what it's like to use Blockseye. Uh, so, so here's a little bit of Python code that I wrote up that just calculates the fees per block over time. Um, and, and fees in, in USD. And so the, the real highlight here is not the graph. It's not a very exciting graph. I'm sure you've, you've seen similar things in other places. Uh, but the highlight is the code above it. Um, and essentially what we've attempted to provide is, is a truly kind of intuitive interface uh, for, for, for doing this sort of work. So that not only kind of hardcore programmers can ask questions about the blockchain and try to understand it, but that we can also hand this hand it over to kind of economists, to I don't know, sociologists, to to what have you, to whoever kind of could gain some some insight and and kind of help out Bitcoin through better understanding, uh, and and have a tool that they could use to to really do do good work. Um, so yeah, so yeah, and that's really my favorite thing about BlockSci is is it's kind of the the broad applicability of it. We have this we have this Python interface for it, which which kind of is is if for people who know Python is, is quite easy to use. Um, as we saw, as you saw, might have seen in the previous example, we easily incorporate external data, data feeds and so it's very easy to, to, for instance, convert between BTC and, and whatever your local currency is. Uh, have, have great support for all of the standard script types and so you can do a really fun thing which is for a given pub key, find everywhere it's appeared on the blockchain, which I've never seen anyone else accomplish and so you could see that if that pub key has been a pay to pub key, a pay to pub key hash, inside a multi-sig, inside a pay to script hash, inside a, a pay to witness pub key hash. And so we can deduplicate on all of those um, and because of this uh, really nice database format. Um, and so the kind of the big, the big thing with Voxi and, and kind of the, the thing I really want to highlight is the performance. And, and kind of, I, I'm really excited about this. Uh, we can iterate over every transaction, every input and output in the blockchain is up slightly old data, but uh, it scales pretty linearly in 10.3 seconds. And so what that means is that the processing capability here, and this is all on a single machine, and we just run on a, on a EC2 instance uh, of, with 64 gigabytes of memory, so nothing that's really hard to, uh, to set up, uh, in which kind of, since it's available online, any of you could, uh, could do so. Um, and so what, and so BlockSci just enables you to, to scale what you're looking at to levels that other tools can't really achieve. Uh, and so, so kind of just a few tidbits of, of kind of how we achieve this performance. As I mentioned earlier, we have this kind of, th this highly customized data format, um, which is all coded up and handled in C++. Uh, we use memory mapping, uh, which it allows you to directly load files into memory and allows the CPU to, and allows the operating system to very efficiently decide what to, uh, what to load and, and how to access your data. And it's all coded in C++, which, which gives it a lot of some, serious, uh, some serious speed. Uh, and, and a caveat to the earlier performance slide, the Python interface I showed you is, is very great to use, but unfortunately is about uh, currently one to three orders of magnitude slower than the C++, which you really have to dive into if you want to, uh, achieve these speeds. But when I say that, I still mean that any kind of reasonable query could still be completed in about a half an hour. Um, now, kind of, so far I focused on, on kind of implications that I think relate to scalability of Bitcoin. I want to also take a second to, to mention kind of some other things blocks I can do. Uh, this is just one piece of analysis we did that I found really interesting, uh, which is kind of a looking into privacy of multisig. Uh, one, one of the purported uses of multisig is, is kind of for organizations to, to manage their funds, uh, where, they will, where they will distribute keys amongst different people. Um, but that allows the leakage of a fair amount of information, since you can know how many keys, you can know exactly what their access patterns are. And uh, one thing we investigated using BlockSci was we looked at places where the keys used for a multisig change slightly. So for instance, if there was a three of three multisig, we found locations where there was an input and an output, which were both multisig, where only one of those three keys changed. 
And that is a fairly substantial violation in kind of organizational privacy. If outside observers can tell when it might just be a key swap or you may have booted somebody out and, and replaced them in, who, for control of your funds. And, and so kind of the fact that you can very easily explore this with blocks I and on the, uh, in, the, in the graph here I show how, much tra how many transactions and, and how much money is actually in outputs that exhibit these signs. And so looking at kind of the last few years, there are recently as much as uh, 10,000 transactions per month that show these key changes and a fair amount of money involved in them. And so these are, these are kind of serious privacy violations that you can also use to, uh, you can also explore using BlockSci. Um, BlockSci has been used uh, already in, in some, a couple uh, pieces of existing work out of my group. Um, we had a very interesting uh, paper, uh, When the Cookie Meets the Blockchain, where we looked at merchant privacy uh, and privacy of users uh, when, when paying for, for goods through online merchant portals. Uh, and, and explored in detail how um, just by knowing the, the value of an output, it was very easily easy to identify a given transaction on the blockchain. Uh, and then the block side paper itself where we show kind of in much greater detail everything that I discussed in this presentation. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for listening. Blockside is, uh, it's a public available on GitHub. Um, I, I would love everyone here to get involved with it. Um, it. Its goal is to be kind of an open source platform that will really enable kind of the spread of, of, of understanding and knowledge about how Bitcoin is, is really used as a platform. Uh, so thank you. thank you. One quick question. Um, to use BlockSci, what indexes do you need on Bitcoin Core? Um, just the default setup. Oh really? You don't even need you don't you don't need the TX, TX index. Oh. Uh, it's it's so the yeah just to give you a short description, uh, we cool. parse all of the block files ourselves uh, without using any sort of indexing. The reason for that, and it's an interesting one, is that we would like to be able to have BlockSci running concurrently with a node and live updating, which is not possible given currently Bitcoin Core's implementation since it uses oh. Level DB yeah. for its indexes, which are only, only support a single reader. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Uh, you mind going back to slide number six or seven, the one that talked about like false flags and different transactions? Uh, nope, before that. Uh, yeah. Before that? Yep. Yeah. yeah, this one. Um, so, two questions on this. How did you identify which transactions are spam and which transactions are real? Um, how did you separate that? And also, I'm finding that like your estimate from for the last like 18 months, it's like a flat line, which seems to be telling me that Bitcoin isn't more useful today than it was a year and a half ago, which seems a little strange. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, more importantly, how did you identify which transactions yeah. what? Um, yeah, so it's a good question, a couple points. Uh, so, so the most important one, this is not really distinguishing, this is not really looking at spam. This is looking at specifically the, the y-axis here is Bitcoin move per day. And so for instance, this, this is only look, and this, so this is really only looking at people, at the use case of Bitcoin, as, as, a, as a medium of exchange. Since we only are really, since we're kind of gauging here how much value in Bitcoin is moving on each day. Um, so, so kind of what we're not, so that, that's kind of part of it. Um, the, uh, and, and so yeah, and so kind of what, what that means is that increased buy-in into Bitcoin where people are not actually moving their currency around at all wouldn't really be reflected on this graph. Um, that, so, so and, and what this does say is, is that the usage of Bitcoin for kind of standard, kind of fairly like commercial interaction, I guess, is not really. All right. So, so yeah. what's the difference between the two? What's the difference between the blue and the orange? Um, so, so the yeah. So the so the specific difference between the two uh, is that number one, the blue contains uh, change, contains the value of output sent to change addresses. And so, for instance, if there's a peeling chain where you have a huge amount that's being sent and sent and sent, uh, then that could the, uh, then the change addresses there could make it look as though there was a huge amount of value moving uh, when really there wasn't. Um, because this is all in, in, in value, not okay. in okay, number of transactions. Uh, and the other one is to discount, uh, we, we discount 
outputs that are spent immediately. Since essentially in, normal, in, in kind of normal circumstances, you wouldn't expect if I send you money, you're, prob you're probably not going to spend it within the next 30 minutes. Um, and so we also discount that for uh, calculating the orange line. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, very interesting. Um, um, I, I was actually looking into stuff like that to uh, do, do more analysis and maybe oh, now cool. this is an interesting tool I can use. Yeah. Um, um, how easy is it to like implement something uh, as a metric, which probably also goes into that one, which I called uh, Bitcoin days destroyed capped. So basically, you th this infamous Bitcoin days destroyed is like basically you take one yeah. Bitcoin, you don't spend it for seven yeah. days, and then you spend your jigsaw, so you have seven Bitcoin days destroyed. Yeah. Problem is like um, it, it distorts sometimes if somebody spends like very old coins, but that doesn't really mean it. That's, yeah. It's been used a lot. So Bitcoin days destroyed is capped. It's pretty much like um, it, it, it works the same thing, but it caps at like one day. So it cannot be yeah. older than one day. So if you have reuse the coins, how easy is it to implement uh, something with um, that? You know, without, without, uh, without kind of going too much in the details, I, I would say probably very easy. Okay. Um, and, and then the second thing is, is do you have like a uh, idea for like a repository where people can like work together like on snippets to like these recipes? Uh, you you were showed yeah that um, one that's a that's a great idea um, I, I mean so kind of it's so Blockside was only released fairly recently uh, publicly at all and it's still very much uh, beta software um, and so kind of we're planning on uh, on on trying to grow that moving forward and uh, yeah I really love the idea of having kind of a, a kind of share collaborative sharing environment where we can do that all right cool thanks, thanks. all right thanks for uh, listening. <laughs>Okay, so we're running a little bit behind schedule, so we're going to adjust uh, things slightly. We do have lunch ready now, so uh, we're going to have the, uh, the talk that was supposed to be up next, um, the measuring maximum sustained transaction throughput on a global network of Bitcoin nodes. That's going to be moved to become the first, lunch, first talk after lunch so that everyone can go eat and be attentive. Um, there are sandwiches out on the patio. There's also a cafe uh, out by the bathrooms if you want to go there. Um, and we will be starting again at 1.50. See you then.